Hello, it's a lovely, lovely good evening once again and good evening to everyone. Starting and good evening once again to everyone, to all those who are already actually live with us and all those who are watching us through SES system. Correct? So if everything is fine, we can start today's this particular session, business combination. Even though each one of you are very well aware of nitty and gritty of this particular chapter. Correct? Even though I told you that you are well aware of every nitty and gritty of this particular chapter. In spite of that, we are going to actually consume a little bit of time so that we can recap the what we call entire what or all the concepts related to this particular chapter. Now, if some of you are interested in writing, you can. Otherwise, you can refrain yourself and simply pay attention over here. So here we go and start today's this particular session. Correct. Kindly pay attention, even though you might have done the things, but still just to refresh those. When I started India's 103, yes, let me actually first of all write here India's 103 business combination. We are starting the session with this particular chapter, India's 103. I need not require to tell you that this happens to be a pretty important chapter from the examination point of view, but we have to consider each and every chapter as very, very important. Correct? There is no room for being selective at this particular level. So if you are uh, ready, then we can start the proceedings. The first thing regarding India's 103, of course, it deals with business combination. The first thing which you need to know as a professional student is that, for instance, suppose there is an entity by the name of A1 and there is another entity by the name of A2. You need not require to write. If some of you are interested in writing, you have to write a little bit fast. Correct? I told there is an entity by the name of A1 and there is another entity by the name of A2. We further presume that this particular entity has invested in this particular entity. And we further presume that their investment is ranging from 1 to 19.99%. Correct? Their investment in A2, A1 has invested in A2 and the range of the investment is falling in between 1 to 19.99%. For example, 7%. 8%, 9%. Now, in this case, as you know better than I, A1 entity will be considered as investor entity and A2 will be considered as investee entity. You know all these things, even I know. But we are just trying to actually refresh the things right from the scratches. So, A1 will be considered as investor entity. The first thing which you need to actually know. And second point is that A2 entity in which investments have been made will be considered as an investee entity. Investee entity. Second point which you need to understand is that in this case, investment which have been made by what we call investor entity A1, they will record the investment or we call it in accounts, account their investment. They will do the accounting for their investment in their individual Accounting will be done, accounting will be done in individual balance sheet, in their individual balance sheet. What we mean by individual balance sheet, for example, entity A1 will prepare what we call its financial position and ultimately it will what we call prepare the financial statement along with financial statement obviously it's because financial balance sheet is also part of financial statement they prepare the balance sheets also so in the balance sheet they will have to reflect the investments which they have made in investee entity now if the range of the investment is in between 1 to 19.9 1 to 19.99 percent such investments are simply known as normal investment. These are normal investment. Is it clear to you? We simply call them as normal investment. These are considered as simply normal investment and accounting for such investment will be done in the individual balance sheet and such investments will be recorded in the balance sheet at fair value, at fair value as per India's 109. So as a professional student, you need to understand that. If suppose you are an entity, if your entity has invested, that means you have purchased some shares of the other entity, it will be called investment. You are the investor entity. The entity in which you have invested will be known as investee entity. Such investment will be considered as normal investment. You will account such investment in your individual balance sheet and you will account them at fair value as per India's 109 as per India's 109. That's all. Now, under the second point which you need to understand is that 
If suppose there is another entity, let us say there is entity by the name of A1 and this entity has invested, this entity has made some investment in other entity by the name of A2. I need not require to tell you that this time A1 will become investor entity because they have made the investment. A1 will be investor entity, A2 will be considered as investee entity. We further presume that this time the range of investment is 20% or more. Range of investment is 20% or more but it is up to 50%. Up to 50%. Suppose if I have acquired let us say 30% share in the other entity. This 30% will fall in this particular range. So if an entity makes investment in the other entity and the range of the investment is falling in between 20 to 20, in between 20 to 50 percent. In this case, this investee entity will be considered as an associate entity. This investee entity will be considered as an associate entity. And when your investment is in between 20 to 50 percent, it means you, you means the investor entity. It means the investor entity is exercising significant influence, SI significant influence. Significant influence means investor entity has got influence over the financial and operational matters of investee entity. They are not having the control over the investee entity but definitely they can participate in their financial and operational activity then we call that we are exercising the significant influence over the other entity. So whensoever we are exercising the significant influence over the other entity, other entity will become our associate entity. That means this time some relationship is existing between the investor entity and the investee entity and this relationship is of investor and associate. Is it clear to you? So whenever there is a relationship, whenever there is a relationship you need to actually pay attention towards this particular point carefully. Whenever there will be a relationship we call that there is a group. That means a group will come into existence only when there is some relationship between the investor entity and the investee entity. Is it clear to you or not? I have already told you we will take two sessions only in between. Please don't ask questions. Try to listen to actually over here. If you really want to get the maximum benefits, remember and have some patience. We simply cannot directly attack the questions. It is very important. Unless and until you are not having the patience, there is no point in actually uh, going through these sessions. Just if I am taking so much of pain of, re pain of recapitulating each and every aspect, howsoever minute it is. Correct? So you need to show a little bit more patience. Anyway, so in this case there is an entity A1, they are having some investment and range of investment is in between 20 to 50 percent. Whenever our investment range will be 20 percent or more and up to 50 percent. Correct? In that case it is said that we are exercising significant influence over the other entity. Other entity will be considered as an associate entity. So whenever there is some relationship like this, we say that a group is coming into the picture. This time the group is comprising of investor and associate. Correct? Combinedly these two entities will be called as a group. Whenever there will be a relationship, a group will come into a picture. And whenever a group will come into a picture, remember one thing, in that particular thing, investor entity will have to do accounting in this manner. Now this time investor will account their investment in their separate financial statement and in their consolidated financial statement. That means in this case investor entity will have to prepare their separate financial statement. Separate financial statement is one in which the investor entity is going to depict the entire picture related to their own affairs. And in consolidated financial statement they are going to reflect the picture of the entire group. Is it clear to you? Now, the important point which you need to keep in your mind is that the, whatever investment which we have made in the investee entity, those investment will be accounted as per IND AS27. As per IND AS27. Correct? This is very important which you need to keep in your mind. So under such circumstances, the investor will have to prepare two types of financial statement. Number one, separate financial statement 
and consolidated financial statement. Separate financial statement is nothing but individual financial statement, but we will call this time instead of individual separate financial statement because this entity is preparing what we call two types of financial statement. One which is depicting its own picture known as what we call a separate financial statement while the other one which will reflect the entire picture of the group will be considered as consolidated financial statement. Is it clear to you or not? If it is fine, then we move further. Consolidated financial statement will be prepared as per end AS 28. As per end AS 28. These things you need to keep in your mind. In the separate financial statement, in the separate financial statement, they will record the investment because they have made some investments. So such investment must be recorded in India as per India S27. And this time investment will be recorded at cost or at fair value or at fair value because India S27 gives a choice to the entity that when you are going to record the investment in your separate financial statement, you have the liberty and the leeway. Either you can record the investment at cost or you can record them at fair value. Is it clear to you or not? Now, these are the two important points. Now we are coming over to another important point, which is related to this particular chapter also. Third important point is that we presume now that there is an another entity. Now this is point number three. There is another entity by the name of A3 and this entity has made some investment and the range of the investment is more than 50%. If an entity makes investment in other entity and the range of investment is more than 50% to 100%. In other entity, let us say other entity is A4. So A3 has made the investment and I have, I have already told you that A3 has invested in the other entity and their investment is more than 50%. Let us say they have purchased 70% stakes in A4. Obviously A4 limited will be investee entity without an iota of doubt. As you know, it will be considered as investee entity while A4, A3 will be considered as investor entity. But most importantly, what you need to know, what you need to know is that this time investee entity will be considered as our subsidiary company. It will be considered as our subsidiary company or what we call acquiry company acquiry acquiry company correct and because this time we have investment in the vicinity of what we call more than 50 percent to 100 percent let us say we have acquired 80 percent 70 percent 90 percent stakes in a4 so whenever your investment would exceed more than 50 percent it means you are acquiring control over the other entity you are acquiring control over the entity. If you are acquiring control over the other entity, then other entity will be considered as your subsidiary entity or it will be considered as an acquiry entity of the investor entity. Obviously, in this case, investor entity is known as parent entity. It is known as parent entity or holding entity. It is known as parent company or holding company or acquirer company acquirer company are you getting my point or not so this time the relationship between what we call investor entity and investee entity is of acquirer and acquiry or parent or subsidiary or holding or subsidiary whatever you may like to call so again there is a relationship if there is a relationship again a group is getting into picture whenever a group will come into picture in that particular case investor entity will have to prepare two types of financial statement i have already told you now in this particular case please pay attention in this particular case as you know parent company holding company or acquirer entity will have to prepare two types of financial statement here you need to pay attention one they will have to prepare separate financial statement and separate financial statement will be prepared as per end AS 27 as per end AS 27 end AS 27 and they will have to prepare consolidated financial statement also 
they will have to prepare the consolidated financial statement also correct now here you have to actually pay attention when they are going to prepare the consolidated financial statement the consolidated financial statement no doubt they will have to prepare but when consolidated financial statement will be prepared on the date of on the date of acquisition on the date of acquisition the date of acquisition we will see later on is one in which you gets control over the other enterprise the date on which acquirer entity acquires the control over the other enterprise then it is known as date of acquisition on this date you will prepare consolidated financial statement correct but such consolidated financial statement will be prepared in accordance with india's 103 India is 103. Is it clear to you or not? So whenever we get control over the other enterprise, in that particular case, acquirer entity will have to prepare separate financial statements. Separate financial statement will be prepared as per India S27, no problem in it. But when we will have to prepare the consolidated financial statement, many a student get confused that when India S103 will be applied and when India S110 will apply. So I'm clarifying at this particular point that consolidated financial statement this time when acquirer entity will prepare on the date of acquisition such consolidated financial statement will be prepared as i told you as per india's 103 while consolidated financial statement they will have to prepare at each year end also that means subsequently whensoever they are going to prepare the consolidated financial statement that means at year end and so on on the date of acquisition consolidated financial statement will be prepared as per india's 103 <coughs> and at the year end at the year end consolidated financial statements are prepared as per india's 110 so this is very vital for you to understand it is it clear to you or not is it clear Correct. I hope that it is clear. So if it is clear, you need to understand carefully that on the date of acquisition, whensoever parent company, you will be called a parent company only if you are having more than 50% stakes in the other entity. You can be called as parent holding or acquirer entity. And other entity will be your subsidiary or acquiry. That means other entity could be your subsidiary or what we call... Uh, uh, other entity could be your subsidiary or acquirer entity only if uh, KMK thoughts you are telling actually it is important that you need to uh, be a little bit uh, you need to have a little bit of background regarding that and I am teaching very slowly to be very honest, you, honest with you right from the scratches itself anyway so here in this particular case other entity could be your investee entity or subsidiary entity or acquiry entity. Is it clear to you? So if you are having a control over the other enterprise in that particular case, because in this chapter, we will see that an entity is having the control over the other entity and the other entity will be your what we call acquiry, uh, your subsidiary or acquiry entity and you will be called as parent company or acquirer entity. Because you are acquirer entity, you are supposed to prepare separate financial statement and consolidated financial statement. If you are going to prepare consolidated financial statement on the date of acquisition, you have to apply in days 103 and at the year end in days 110. This is very important. Is it clear to you? So if it is clear to you, then we move a little bit further. We move a little bit further now. And in order to understand what we call some more important aspects regarding this particular chapter, I have already told you that you need to understand that so often we need to understand and confront this particular word group. I have already told you a group will come into picture only when there is some relationship and relationship could be of investor and subsidiary company. If you are an investor, then other entity could be your subsidiary entity only if you are having the control. Other entity could will be your subsidiary or acquiry entity. So it is a group. Similarly, if you have investment in the vicinity of, as I already told you, in the vicinity, in the vicinity of 20 to 50 percent, in that case, there could be a relationship like this investor and associate. 
सो यू मस्ट अंडरस्टैंड बाय नाउ एक्चुअली करेक्ट यू मस्ट अंडरस्टैंड बाय नाउ दैट वेन एवर देयर इज अ रिलेशनशिप ए ग्रुप गेट्स फॉर्म एंड वेन एवर ए ग्रुप वुड गेट फॉर्म the investor entity will have to prepare separate financial statement and consolidated financial statement this is one point which you need to understand now we come over to this particular chapter business combination what we mean by business combination first of all you need to understand that business combination in the initial stages you will have to actually show little bit of patience in the sense because even though these are revisionary sessions even though these are revisionary sessions but not we are going to simply for the sake of revision actually complete the things correct if date of acquisition is at the year end and you are going to prepare first time your consolidated financial statement of course in that particular case you will have to follow because on date of acquisition on the date of acquisition i told you date of acquisition could be at in the beginning or at the end then you will have to apply india's 103 good question business combination what we mean by business combination just pay attention over here for example let us say there is an entity and there is another entity by the name of b now this entity has got control over this particular entity could you tell me actually how the control can be acquired by entity a how entity a could have acquired control over this particular entity i just told you a moment ago this and i am telling this entity is having control over what we call this particular entity you can acquire control over the other entity only when your investment in the other entity is more than 50% is it clear to you or not so whenever an entity acquires control over the other entity that is known as business combination is it clear to you business combination simply refers to the process whereby an one entity gets control over the other entity and just a moment ago i also told you the entity which is obtaining the control will be known as acquirer entity or parent entity while the other entity will be known as subsidiary entity or acquirer entity although in this particular chapter we are going to use these terms acquirer and acquirer instead of parent and subsidiary is it clear to you or not right <clears throat> if this is correct now we move a bit further i also told you when we get control on that particular date we will have to prepare the consolidated financial statement in the light of indias 103 but it is also very important that indias 103 or business combination will come into picture only when you are getting or control over the other enterprise and other other enterprise is meeting the what we call definition of the business is it clear to you or not for example this entity must meet the definition of business other entity must be a business then only indias 103 or indias 110 will come into picture that mean when we get control over the other enterprise the other enterprise definitely is our acquirer entity and we are the acquirer entity but in order to do the accounting in the light of indias 103 and indias 110 we need to understand that the other entity must meet the definition of business now what we mean by business business means the other entity must actually this standard defines business in simple words containing three elements correct that mean this other entity must have some inputs must have some processes and must have some output what i mean by this for example other entity must have some input must have some processes and must have some output indirectly what i am trying to tell you is that when we say inputs that mean other entity must have some resources and when we say resources it means group of assets group of assets p stands for processes processes stands for techniques techniques and by combining these two we must be in a position to generate output output means here revenue that mean if i am acquiring the business of a particular entity and i am also acquiring the control 
करेक्ट दैट अदर एंटिटी मस्ट मीट द डेफिनेशन ऑफ बिजनेस इन द सेंस दैट मीन अदर एंटिटी मस्ट बी हैविंग सम एसेट्स एंड लायबिलिटी सम एसेट्स अ ग्रुप ऑफ एसेट्स सम प्रोसेसेस टेक्निक्स दैट इज टेक्निकल नो हाउ एंड आई शुड बी द एक्वायर एंटिटी शुड बी इन अ पोजीशन ऑफ इंटीग्रेटिंग इनपुट्स एंड आउट इनपुट्स एंड प्रोसेसेस और रिसोर्सेस एंड द टेक्निक्स टू जनरेट सम आउटपुट दैट इज रेवेन्यू देन ओनली देन ओनली इट विल बी कंसीडर्ड एज अ केस ऑफ बिजनेस कॉम्बिनेशन is it clear to you business combination will come into picture only when you are getting the control over the other enterprise and other enterprise is meeting the definition of the business is it clear to you or not if it is clear then we move a bit further now just a moment all moment ago i told you that we can acquire control over the other enterprise we can acquire control over the other enterprise how we can acquire the control over the other enterprise one way is that by acquiring more than 50% stakes this is one way of getting control over the other enterprise is it clear to you if suppose my investment in the other entity is 80% then it can be construed very easily that i am having more than 50% stakes i am having the control remember one thing when you are having the control over the other enterprise many a student i have seen through my experience actually confuse it with it we are simply having the control we haven't acquired the enterprise are you getting my point or not that mean other enterprise will still be functioning of its own but only thing is that that particular entity will function and operate under our direction under our control that particular the that particular entity will not come to an end because you are simply acquiring the control over the other enterprise is it clear to you that mean when we acquire control over the other enterprise that doesn't mean that we have acquired the other enterprise other enterprise will keep on functioning independently only thing is that those entities where you are having the control will function under your direction under your dictates under your policies that's the only thing but they will function they will operate they will continue to operate second thing is that you can also get control by acquiring net assets of the other entity suppose there is an entity a and there is another entity b and entity a acquires all the assets and liabilities of other entity b even this way you are getting the control over the other enterprise here you are not making any investment <clears throat> what you are doing is that you have purchased and acquired all the assets and liabilities of the other entity this is another way of getting control over the other entity one way is that you can simply make the investment in the other entity and another way is that you can simply acquire the net assets of the other entity now in this case you will have to be very cautious you will have to exercise caution in the sense that when you get control over the other entity by simply acquiring their net assets in this case acquiry company will cease to exist acquiry company will cease to exist will cease to exist cease to exist the moment you are going to take all the assets and the liabilities of the other entity correct this is one way of getting the control over the other entity but in this case other entity will cease to exist it will no more exist and if because entity is no more existing acquiry entity is no more existing in this case no consolidated financial statements will be prepared i already told you when you get control over the other enterprise by what we call making some investment in that case acquirer entity will have to prepare two types of financial statements that is separate financial statement and consolidated financial statement and on the date of acquisition when we will prepare consolidated balance consolidated financial statement those will be as per india standard in 3 and at the year end whenever we are going to prepare consolidated financial statement that will be as per india standard in 10 but when we get control over the other enterprise by taking over their assets and liability in that particular case that particular entity will simply die down it will no more exist and because it is not existing no question of preparing any consolidated financial statement is it clear to you or not yes sir it is clear if it is clear till up to this particular point things are clear or not kindly let me know after that now if it is clear now we move over to the next part the next part concerns itself with the accounting process now we come across accounting process accounting process 
how we are going to do the accounting. It is important that whenever, let us say, entity A is getting control over the other entity by acquiring 75% stakes. Obviously, A entity A is acquirer entity and entity B is actually what we call HEP is our acquiry entity. Now we will have to do the accounting. From the perspective of the acquirer, the entire accounting pattern will be like this because you are the acquirer entity and you will have to do the accounting. So under business combination, the first thing is that when we do accounting, the first point which we need to take care of is that we need to determine the acquirer. We need to determine the acquirer. The moment I told you earlier that there is an entity A and this entity is acquiring 75% stakes of entity B. Because we are acquiring 75% shares of entity B, we are not going to acquire the shares free of cost. We will have to pay some amount to entity B. That amount which will be paid by us is known as purchase consideration. It is known as purchase consideration. Now, the standard says that when we do the accounting, when we do the accounting, we need to identify who is the acquirer entity and who is the acquirer entity. Those among you who are doing this chapter first time, kindly pay attention. Actually, you might be wondering why standard has laid down this particular step, determination of acquirer. It is very clear that entity A is the acquirer entity and entity B is the what we call acquiry entity. Now, just pay attention. No doubt, because entity A is acquiring the stakes and it is paying the consideration without any iota of doubt, entity A will be known as acquirer but entity A will be called as legal acquirer. Legal acquirer. Legal acquirer. That means from the legal angle, from the eyes of the law or in the eyes of the law, entity A happens to be the legal acquirer entity. While entity B will be called as legal acquiry. Legal acquiry. That means in the eyes of the law, Without an iota of doubt, as I told you, entity A will be considered as an acquiry, as an acquirer, and entity B will be considered as legal acquiry entity. That means legally we are acquirer, and legally entity B is acquiry entity. But this step say, the demand of this particular step is that who will be considered as acquirer from the perspective of the accounting? from the perspective of the accounting. That means we have to determine who will be accounting acquirer. We, besides the legal acquirer and acquiry, you need to acquaint yourself with this particular term, accounting acquirer. Accounting acquirer. Now, who will be considered as accounting acquirer? Generally, that entity is considered as accounting acquirer who is having the control. Quite obviously, in this case, entity A is having the control. So, entity A will be considered as an accounting acquirer and entity B will be called as accounting acquiry. 99.999% legal acquirer will remain the accounting acquirer and legal acquiry will also remain the legal uh, accounting acquiry. Sorry. Are you getting my point or not? 99.99% I told you the legal acquirer will remain the accounting acquirer and 99.99% entity B which is legal acquiry will also be the accounting acquiry. But on rare situations, on rare situation, it may happen like this. For example, let us say there is an entity A and there is entity B. We also presume that entity A is having 75% control over entity B. Without any doubt from the legal angle, entity A is a acquirer entity and entity B is acquiry entity from the legal angle. No doubt about that. But let us say there is an agreement between A and B and sometime it happens in practical life. That in spite of the fact that A has got 75% stakes in B and A is also having technically speaking control. But let us say there is an arrangement or agreement between entity A and B that 
कंट्रोल विल लाई इन दी हैंड्स ऑफ एन टी टी बी कंट्रोल विल लाई इन दी हैंड्स ऑफ एन टी टी बी सो इन दिस केस यू आर हैविंग सेवेंटी फाइव परसेंट स्टेक्स इन एन टी टी बी बट द फैक्ट इज दैट बिकॉज ऑफ दी सेपरेट अरेन्जमेंट और बिकॉज ऑफ दी सेपरेट एग्रीमेंट इट इज क्लियरली रिटर्न दैट एन टी टी बी विल बी हैविंग द कंट्रोल सो इन दिस केस यू आर लीगल एक्वायर बट यू आर नॉट वॉट वी कॉल अकाउंटिंग एक्वायर अकाउंटिंग एक्वायर विल बी कंसिडर्ड एज वॉट वी कॉल एन टी टी बी इज इट क्लियर टू यू आर नॉट एंड सच ए सिचुएशन वी विल सी लेटर ऑन इज नोन एज रिवर्स रिवर्स एक्वेजेशन वील कॉल वी विल एक्सप्लेन इट सेपरेटली इज इट क्लियर टू यू सो बट सम टाइम इट मे बी ए पॉसिबिलिटी सो दैट इज वाई स्टैंडर्ड लेस डाउन दिस पर्टिकुलर क्राइटेरिया डेट योर फर्स्ट स्टेप इज टू डिटर्मिन हू विल बी दी लीग हु विल बी दी अकाउंटिंग एक्वायर सो नाइंटी नाइन परसेंट लीगल एक्वायर इट सेल्फ हैपन्स टू बी दी अकाउंटिंग एक्वायर सो यू नीड टू रिक्वायर टू बॉर्डर ऑन दैट पर्टिकुलर अकाउंट second step is once you have determined that in whose books the accounting will be done obviously the accounting will be done in the books of accounting acquirer now the second step is to determine acquisition date acquisition date what is this acquisition date acquisition date is one on which date of control has been acquired on which it is the date on which control has been acquired control has been acquired control has been acquired for example let us say in this particular case entity a acquired 75% stakes let us say on 7th of july 2026 on this date we acquired the control and we further presume that because we are acquiring 75% stakes on this particular date we will have to discharge the purchase consideration also because unless and until we are going to pay the amount we cannot get 75% stakes so on this particular date we have acquired 75% stakes and we have paid purchase consideration so date of acquisition is one on which actually you have acquired the control correct Con control has been acquired and date of control and date of control is one on which purchase consideration is discharged purchase consideration is discharged purchase consideration is discharged that mean acquisition date is one on which you are acquiring the control over the other enterprise number one and it will be considered as that you have acquired the control on the date on which you have discharged the consideration that date will be considered as date of acquisition is it clear to you now first two steps are to be very honest with you are very simple and you need not require to actually exercise much mental strain to determine who is legal acquirer and what is your date of acquisition under the third step what you are supposed to do the third step deals with purchase consideration as i told you purchase consideration is the amount which the acquirer entity is going to pay to the acquiring entity obviously when we are getting some stakes we will have to pay some amount that amount from the perspective from the perspective of the acquirer entity is known as purchase consideration now the point important is that we can pay we purchase consideration that mean we can discharge the purchase consideration simply by what we call giving cash to the acquiry entity or we can simply issue them equity share capital or we can discharge the purchase consideration by issuing debentures of our entity that mean purchase consideration can be discharged by way of cash equity share capital debentures bonds etc but important point is that purchase consideration is always computed at fair value you purchase consideration is always computed at fair value that mean when you are discharging the purchase consideration by way of equity share capital debentures or bond you are going to consider the fair value we will also see later on that purchase consideration also also includes contingent consideration now what we mean by contingent cons consideration now before i move further let me also clarify generally in the long question you will 
you need not require to compute the amount of purchase consideration because it will always be given to you it will always be given to you however some questions some concept based question on contingent consideration and deferred consideration may be asked in the examination what we mean by contingent consideration for example let us say entity a is taking over the business of entity b and let us say business has been taken over on 1st of July 2026. This is our date of control or date of acquisition. On the date of acquisition, let us say we have decided that in order to discharge the purchase consideration, we will pay 100 lakhs rupees by way of share capital. So this is purchase consideration, no doubt. But sometime what happens, sometime what happens, the acquirer entity tells to the acquiry entity that we are going to pay you some more amount. Let us say in this case, entity A tells entity B that we are going to pay you 10 lakh rupees provided in the next two years, in the next two years, you will be able to generate a profit of five crores for us. Then we will pay you 10 lakhs more. Even though this 10 lakh will be paid after two years, and it will be paid only if entity B will be able to meet the condition. So contingent, contingent means something which depends upon the future course of action. Your success depends upon how much hard work you are going to put or how deeply you are going to study these sessions and how patiently you are going to actually study these sessions. This is important. So something is contingent. Likewise, here entity B is telling, entity A is telling to entity B that we are going to pay additional 10 lakh rupees, but it will be paid only if you are going to generate a profit of what two crores for us in the next two years. Now the point is that whether this 10 lakh will be payable or not, that will be decided only after two years. Point is this, that it will be decided only after two years. If entity B is able to meet the condition, we will have to pay 10 lakh. If entity B is not able to meet the uh, what we call this, this condition, then quite obviously we need not require to pay 10 lakh. But in spite of that, standard says that if you have promised some amount, then you will include it as part of purchase consideration. So if there is some contingent consideration, it will also be made a part of purchase consideration. And what we mean by deferred consideration, deferred consideration and contingent consideration are quite similar, but there is a slight difference between these two. In case of deferred consideration, we simply tell to entity B that we are going to pay you 5 lakh more after 2 years and no condition will be attached over here. That means this time we will have to pay them 5 lakh. So whatever amount of deferred consideration or contingent consideration is there, we will have to include that as part of purchase consideration. So purchase consideration number one could be in cash, could be by way of shares, could be by way of debenture, bond, or partly by way of cash, debenture, or bonds. Purchase consideration also includes contingent consideration and what we call deferred consideration. But whatever will be included in purchase consideration will be included at fair value. Is it clear to you or not? However, I have already told you that in the examination, you will be escaped of doing all these things because the amount of purchase consideration will be very clearly given to you. However, some concept-based question could be asked from contingent consideration and what we call deferred consideration, which I will pick up later on. Correct? Now the next step, next step is step number four. After having determined who is the, what we call accounting acquirer, what is the date of the acquisition, and obviously what is the amount of purchase consideration, the next step is recording of assets and liability. Recording, measurement, recognition, Recording, measurement, and recognition. Recognition. Suppose this is what we call our acquiry entity. Whenever I will write A2, it means I am referring to acquiry entity. Because we have obtained the control over the other entity, obviously other entity must be having some assets, liability, etc. The general rule is that the general rule is that because you are obtaining the control over the other entity, you will have to prepare the consolidated financial statement. You means the acquirer entity. Because you will have to prepare the consolidated financial statement. When we say consolidated, it means we will have to combine the assets and liabilities of acquirer entity and acquiry entity. But how can we combine them? 
unless and until we will bring the assets of acquiry entity and liabilities of the acquiry entity into our books we cannot what we call prepare the consolidated financial statement so in order to what we call bring all the assets and liabilities of the acquiry entity into our books actually we have to do some accounting so the general rule is that whatever assets and liabilities which are appearing in the balance sheet of the acquiry entity you are going to record them you are going to record them all the assets and all the liability the general rule is that whatever assets are appearing in the balance sheet of acquiry entity and whatever liabilities are appearing you will have to record them and record them at fair value you will have to record them at fair value this is very simple is it clear to you or not all the assets and liabilities will be recorded and recorded at fair value however there might be some items which are not recorded in the balance sheet for example let us say there is a contingent liability there is a contingent liability of acquiry entity now what is a contingent liability a contingent liability means it is an obligation what we mean by obligation obligation means there is some pressure upon you you are bounded to do something correct that is obligation contingent liability is considered what is contingent liability first of all and before i move further let me also told you generally contingent liability are what we call not recorded in the balance sheet they are simply disclosed by way of notes as you know better than i now what is a contingent liability it is an obligation where chances or probability of outflow of funds are quite slim are you getting my point or not for example entity a2 is having some dispute they are running they are having some dispute with one of their clients with one of their clients they are having some dispute with their one of clients now client has put up a case over entity a2 entity a2 is of the opinion even though client are demanding some money from us but in our opinion chances or probability of outflow of funds are quite insignificant so because there is no probability of outflow of funds or there is less probability of outflow of funds such obligations are treated as what we call contingent liability and generally contingent liability are not recognized in the financial statement i have already told you this is the general rule correct however this particular standard under business combination even though if the acquiry company is having a contingent liability you will have to record that particular liability as a liability the contingent liability will be recognized when we say recognize that when you will treat this contingent liability as a liability this liability is not recorded in their what we call financial in spite of that you will have to record them and you will record them obviously at fair value is it clear to you or not correct when we will do the accounting you need to take care of this particular item similarly there might be some item which might have not recorded as an asset by the what we call acquiry entity now let us say acquiry entity is having some intangible assets but they haven't recorded them as an assets or they haven't recorded them at all even such assets will have to be recorded and recorded at fair value as i told you similarly if acquiry entity is having some liabilities like income tax payable income tax payable or employee benefits even such liabilities will be taken over and those liabilities will be taken over but those those will be recorded as per provisions of india s 112 and as per provisions of what we call 90 actually what happens in practical life generally if i take over the control over the other enterprise generally i am not going to take over their such liability like income tax liability like in any liability related to employee benefit but under business combination if you are taking the control over the other enterprise then you will have to take over even such liabilities but you are going to record such liability as per the provisions of relevant standard as you know india s12 deals with income tax and similarly what we call india s19 deals with employee benefits is it clear to you or not so these are and further just one more point if this particular entity is are having some non current assets which have been classified as held for sale classified as held for sale classified as held for sale held for sale correct if this particular entity is having some non current assets which have been classified as held for sale as you know india's 105 deals with such assets 
NDS 105 deals with non-current asset held held by an enterprise and classified as held for sale. Even if this entity is having such assets, those assets will have to be taken over by us and we will have to record them at fair value, less cost to sale. You will understand them later on when I'm going to do the question. But at this particular moment, the point I'm trying to make you understand is that while taking over assets and liability, you have to exercise caution that you will have to take over all the assets and liabilities at fair value. If there are some contingent liability, you will also record them and treat them as what we call liability. You will take over them and you will record them at fair value. Besides that, if acquiring entity is having such liability, income tax related to income tax or employee benefits, even such liabilities will be taken over. Similarly, if they are having some intangible assets, you are going to take them over. And besides that, even such assets, Asset, non current asset held for sale will have to be taken over. Correct? When I will do the question, you will be able to understand them better. So, what we have seen as far as steps of what we call accounting are concerned, the number one step is determination in whose books the accounting will be done, that is determination of accounting acquired. Second, determination of acquisition date. Acquisition date is one in which control has been passed. Is it clear to you or not or on the date on which you have acquired the control over the other entity? Third step is determination of purchase consideration. Fourth step is what we call recording. Record, when we say recording, that means taking over assets and liabilities. Another step is determination of another step. This is our fifth step. NCI. NCI, it is known as non-controlling interest. And standard also says that while doing the accounting, you will also talk about goodwill. That means if I'm taking over or obtaining the control over the other enterprise, when I will do the accounting, I will have to reflect the NCI and goodwill also. But how? The point is that. So in order to make you understand that, now we come to the real part of this particular session. Now kindly actually pull out your pen and pencil, especially those who, who are doing this particular chapter first time. Whatever I'm doing today, now, you can take for my words, you are going to get a question out of that in the upcoming examination. Is it clear to you? Now kindly pay attention. Let us say <clears throat> I'm giving you a sort of very small balance sheet to make you understand the accounting aspects. Let us say there is an entity by the name of A and there is another entity by the name of B. Is it clear to you? For simplicity's sake, I'm preparing the balance sheet in this manner. Now this is the balance sheet, a very small balance sheet I'm preparing. Now in this particular balance sheet, I have written towards the liability side share capital. We also presume that one share is of rupees 10 and share capital of entity A is 10 lakh. Share capital of entity B is equal to 5 lakh. Further, I write here other equity. What we mean by other equity? Other equity stands for general reserve, reserve fund, profit and loss account. Correct? Other equity. Other equity. Let us say amount of other equity is 5 lakh for entity A and we further presume that it is 10 lakh for entity B. And now I simply write here liabilities. I already told you I'm putting up a very small balance sheet extract before you. Now liability amount is 20 lakhs and 10 lakhs. 20 lakhs and 10 lakhs. Correct? Share capital is 10 lakh and 5 lakh. Number one, other equity 5 lakh, 10 lakh, liability 20 lakh and 10 lakh. Then I move further. Property, plant and equipment. On the asset side, in the column of A, I write here 30 lakhs. How much? 30 lakhs. Then I write 15 lakhs. So property, plant of entity B, 15 lakhs. Then current assets. These are non-current asset, property, plant and equipment and current assets that is equal to 5 lakh and 10 lakh. So total is equal to 35 lakh, 25 lakh, 35 lakh and 25 lakh. Then I write further that on 1-4-2026, on 1-4-2026, a limited 
a limited acquires a limited acquires 60 percent a limited acquires 60 percent stakes a limited acquires 60 percent stakes in b limited in b limited and pays consideration and pays consideration of pays consideration of pays consideration of rupees 12 lakh pays consideration of rupees 12 lakh correct <clears throat> Now you let me know out of these two company which will be considered as what we call accounting acquirer. Who will be considered as accounting acquirer? Step number one. Now let me know who is accounting acquirer. Kindly let me know of that. Who is accounting acquirer? Your first step is to determine in whose books you are going to actually do the accounting. Now you let me know who is the accounting acquirer. Yes, quickly. Sudeep gave me the answer A limited. Obviously, A limited in this case is accounting acquirer and legal acquirer both, no doubt about that. Why? Number one, because entity A is acquiring stakes and they are having the control. So, A limited is going to be the accounting acquirer. Now, kindly give me answer to another question. What will be your date of acquisition or date of control? What will be your date of acquisition in this particular case? Because I have specified that date on 1-4-2026, you have acquired 60% stakes and on this date, you have discharged the consideration. Is it clear to you? So obviously, the date of acquisition in this particular case will be considered as 1-4-2026. Now, what will be your third step? What will be the amount of purchase consideration? Now, in this question, I have already told you, in most of the question or almost in every question, you will you need not require to compute purchase consideration. It will always be given in the question. So, purchase consideration is 12 lakh. Amount of purchase consideration is how much? That is equal to 12 lakh. Now, it is not given in the question in what manner purchase consideration is being discharged. So, if it is not given in, in the question, you can presume that it is being discharged by way of shares. Because generally, when we acquire the control over the other enterprise, generally we discharge the consideration by way of shares. Because it is not specified in this particular example, let us say, that how entity A is delivering the consideration. So always can presume that consideration is being discharged by way of shares. Correct? Now under step number four, under step number four, what I am supposed to do? Under step number four, I need to do some calculations and such calculations will be known as calculation with respect to calculation of goodwill or gain on bargain purchase or gain on bargain purchase. So now I have to determine the amount of goodwill or gain on bargain purchase. Gain on bargain purchase is a term which is used under NDS and it is similar to capital reserve. Correct? So those among you who are doing it first time, this particular chapter for them actually I am telling you, gain on bargain purchase is nothing but it is synonymous of what we call, uh, it is synonymous with respect to uh, term capital reserve. So now instead of calling it capital reserve, we call it gain on bargain purchase. So your next step should be or your next step is actually to determine the amount of goodwill or gain on bargain purchase. Now how to determine the amount of goodwill or gain on bargain purchase, just pay attention. In order to determine the amount of goodwill or gain on bargain purchase, first of all, I need to or in fact, you need to find out net assets of acquiry company net assets of acquiry company. Now, could you tell me how we find net assets? In order to find out the net assets, we simply use these two things, assets less liability. 
correct right from your journey into the accounting sphere from your class 11 till this particular date you are using this equation so many times now could you let me know actually what is the amount of total assets of subsidy of what we call acquiry entity 15 lakh plus 10 lakh 25 lakh so total asset is equal to 25 lakh i will write here 25 lakh <clears throat> Now, could you let me know what we call the amount of liability? Amount of liability of B Limited, which is acquiry entity, is equal to 10 lakh. So, I am going to write here 10 lakh. I am going to write here 10 lakh. So, that means total net assets is equal to 15 lakh. In order to determine the goodwill, you need to determine the net assets of the acquiry company. Now, each one of you are well aware, actually, net assets always stands for assets minus liability. That means we can always find out net assets of what we call acquiry entity by using this particular equation. However, my advice will be, instead of computing net assets in this manner, you better actually compute it in this manner. We also know, actually, that net assets are always equal to equity. You have already studied in your class 11th, in your class 12th, and in your earlier phases of education that net assets is always equal to equity. Now, what we mean by equity? Equity means basically share capital plus other equity. Other equity means general reserve, profit and loss account, reserve fund, etc. So, let me see actually... Uh, uh, how I am going to compute by using what we call uh, equity method. So under equity method, we have to actually take care of share capital and other equity. You can see share capital is 5 lakh and other equity of entity B limited is 10 lakh. So directly we can compute the same result. So share capital is 5 lakh. So I am going to write here 5 lakh. And under other equity, I am going to put up 10 lakh. So you can see actually, still we are getting the same result, that is 15 lakhs. And my advice to each one of you is to compute the net assets in this manner, henceforth. Is it clear to you? Don't use this, because sometime when we will go by, thi go by this methodology, it could land us in trouble. How and why that I will explain it later on. But at this particular moment, it is always important that you have, you need to actually keep in your mind that you are going to use this method methodology of computing the net assets. After having computed the net assets, the next step is, next step is you write the amount of net assets. The net assets is equal to 15 lakh. Net asset is equal to 15 lakh. Is it clear to you? Now, after writing down the net assets, you simply break net assets into two parts. Correct? Try to understand this particular point. You are computing net assets of B limited. You are computing net assets of B limited, isn't it or not? You are computing net assets of B limited. In B Limited, entire share capital of B Limited is in the hands of only two parties. One is acquirer entity having 60% stakes. It is clearly written in the question A Limited is having 60% stakes in entity B. That means 40% stakes are not in the hands of A Limited. So we will call that these shares are held by other shareholders. So entire share capital of A Limited, we can generalize that is in the hands of two parties. One, acquirer entity having 60% stakes and other shareholder having 40% stakes. Now, because this party A Limited is having the control over this particular enterprise, this is the acquirer entity. But other parties are not having the control over this particular entity. That is why other shareholders are known as non-controlling interest holder. Other shareholders are known as non-controlling interest holder. Why? Because they are having the interest, but they are not having the control. Non-controlling interest holder. So whenever we are going to make some investment in the other entity, whenever we are going to make investment in the other entity, quite obviously we are going to have what we call share in the net assets. Suppose if I say that your investment in a particular entity is 10%, what does it reflect? It reflects that 
that whatever net assets of other entity are there, ten percent out of those net net assets belong to you. Likewise, here when I say I have to break the net assets, what I am trying to tell you is that you need to now find out. the share of acquirer entity in the net asset and share of non controlling interest holder in the net assets now we have seen that nci is 40% because acquirer company is having 60% stakes in this particular entity acquirer entity is having 60% stakes in entity b so it means other shareholder that is non controlling interest holder they are having only 40% stakes now you kindly compute 40% of 15 lakh i think it will be equal to 6 lakh so as i told you earlier while doing the accounting we also need to find out the nci when we say nci indirectly it means we are trying to find out the value of the asset value of the net asset which belong to nci so now you can safely actually con conclude that out of 15 lakh 6 lakh worth of asset belong to actually nci non controlling interest holder is it clear to you or not now what will be the share of acquirer entity what will be the share of acquirer entity share of acquirer entity 60% now 60% of 15 lakh happens to be 9 lakh if i am not wrong so after segregating the net assets after having segregated the net assets of what we call subsidiary company into share of nci and share of acquirer entity now you are in a position to compute the amount of goodwill in order to compute the amount of goodwill what you have to do simply write first of all consideration in order to compute the goodwill what you have to do now simply take into account consideration now could you tell me what is the amount of consideration sir amount of consideration actually is 12 lakh right because acquirer entity is paying an amount of 12 lakh on the date of acquisition to get control over the other enterprise so on the date of control you have paid a consideration of 12 lakh you means the acquirer entity against this particular payment we are getting 60% stake 60% control and indirectly it means we are getting what we call 9 lakh worth of net assets so i will now write here less share of share of acquirer share of acquirer share of acquirer in net assets of in net assets of acquiry in net assets of acquiry company in net assets of acquiry company you are paying 12 lakh and against that you are getting a benefit of 9 lakh only so that mean you are paying more and getting less so because you are paying more and getting less that mean the extra amount which you are paying will be considered as goodwill it will be considered as goodwill is it clear to you it will be presumed that you are paying 3 lakh extra simply for the reputation of the other entity that is why it is considered as goodwill correct in case if the amount of consideration is less than the share obviously in that particular case uh, i will write gain on bargain purchase is it clear to you that mean i told you actually that we have to do the computation with respect to goodwill gain on bargain purchase and also nci also nci so in this particular step i have shown you actually how you are going to arrive over what we call nci goodwill gain on bargain purchase or something like that but 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 kindly pay attention kindly pay attention because in the initial stages see you will have to actually show lots of patience if you are able to do so then only as i am i have been telling so often now we will get the maximum benefit now try to understand that it is my duty to finish the revision the recession correct so you need not require to bother if i am taking so much of pain then you should be ready for the same also however this is step henceforth we are not going to actually do in the manner the which we have just done for example this entire step henceforth we are not going to do it in this manner so then how we are going to do it that i will tell you now in instead of all these things what we are going to do under step number 4 correct see here in this step where we need to compute goodwill nci etc henceforth we are going to apply this methodology i will simply prepare an analysis table 
analysis table. I will simply prepare an analysis table. Correct? You will prepare simply an analysis table. In this analysis table, in one column, you can you will write particulars or details. Particulars. I am taking these classes in spite of the fact that I am today having very high fever. But because I promised, I am carrying out my promise. And then, we will write here acquirer. Acquirer. And the stakes of acquirer 60%. Then I will write here NCI, non-controlling interest holder, simply put other shareholders. Correct? When you will prepare the analysis table, all you need to do is, actually we are preparing analysis table in order to find out the net assets. Because under step number four, I have already told you, we have to actually prepare the, we have to find out the net assets. I told you there are two methods of computing net assets. One, where you simply take the difference between the assets and liability. However, I have already told you, you are not going to use this particular method. We will use this method. Actually, my intention is to find out the net assets, but in this manner. So in order to find out the net assets on the date of acquisition, my first question to you is that what is the amount of share capital on the date of acquisition of acquiry entity? What is the amount of share capital? Now, if you will look over in the question, the amount of share capital, let us say this is the balance sheet as on 31st of 12, 2026. In 31st of 3, 2026. Correct? Now, in accounts 31st 3, 2006, uh, 31st 3, 2026 or 1, 4, 2026 are considered as one single date. Is it clear to you? It's considered as one single date. Is it clear? So, we can safely assume that on 1, 4, 2026 share capital of this particular entity is 5 lakh. So, I will simply write here 5 lakh. Then you also write here other equity on the date of acquisition other equity on the date of acquisition. I am writing here DOA. It means on the date of acquisition, what is the amount of share capital and what is the amount of other equity? I have to take note of that. So other equity, as we have just seen earlier, is actually 10 lakh. And I just a moment ago, I told you we can arrive over the amount of net assets by simply adding share capital and other equity. So we can see net assets of subsidiary company is equal to 15 lakh is equal to 15 lakh on the date of acquisition. Is it clear to you? After having computed the amount of net assets on the date of acquisition, you simply now find out 60% of this amount that is equal to 9 lakh. That means out of total net assets of acquiry entity, 9 lakh worth of net assets belong to acquirer entity and 6 lakh worth of net assets belong to NCI. This is how you are going to do what we got from next time, this particular step. Is it clear to you? So once you have in your hands the respective share, now you can easily find out the amount of goodwill, etc. So although I have already computed the goodwill, still I am doing it for you. Consideration. Amount of consideration as we saw earlier is equal to 12 lakh. So I will write here 12 lakh and then I will subtract the share of acquirer entity share of acquirer entity in the net assets of acquiry entity is equal to 9 lakh. So amount of goodwill which we have already computed earlier is equal to 3 lakh. Is equal to 3 lakh. This is our step number 4. And under step number 5, I will have to reflect NCI. I will write here NCI. But we have already computed NCI. NCI means out of total net asset, what worth of asset belong to actually non-controlling interest holder on the date of acquisition? Because whatever accounting we are doing, we are doing it on the date of acquisition. So that means 6 lakh worth of net asset belong to NCI. After having done that, now on the date of acquisition, I will have to prepare the balance sheet. But before I prepare the balance sheet, I need to pass an entry. Step number six. Your next step is step number six. Under step number six, I will have to pass an entry. Now you are the acquirer entity. 
and you are obtaining the control over the other entity you have to prepare the consolidated financial statement for that you will have to now include the assets and liability of the uh, entity b that is a query entity in your books and for that you will have to actually do the recording entry how we are going to do the recording entry i just told you all the assets and liability of what we call entity B, that is a query entity, you will take into account. So you will write here property, plant and equipment account debit. Now what is the amount of property, plant and equipment which is appearing in the balance sheet? In the balance sheet, it is appearing at 15 lakh. We are presuming that whatever items are written in the balance sheet of a query entity are at fair value because fair values are not given separately and standard says that we have to record all the assets and liability at fair value so we are presuming that all these assets and liability whatever given in the balance sheet are at fair value only so property plant and equipment of entity b is 15 lakh so i will record 15 lakh then there are some current assets also of entity b so current assets of entity b is equal to 10 lakh i will record 10 lakh also Besides that, I will record the liabilities. What is the amount of liability? 10 lakh, I think. Two liability account. And besides that, besides that, you will write here two, consid two consideration, two consideration payable account. Two consideration account, you can simply write. The amount of consideration is 12 lakh. And then you will write here to NCI also, to non-controlling interest, 6 lakh. Now, if you will take the difference of this particular entity, that difference will give you the same result. You can also derive the amount of goodwill by passing this particular entity. You will get the same result. You will get a difference of rupees 3 lakh towards the debit side and that difference will be considered as goodwill. Is it clear to you? That means in order to arrive over the amount of the goodwill, we can simply what we call pass this particular entry also instead of what we call doing all these things. But still you need to become very deft in what we call attaining a real good command or preparation of this particular table because it will help you and hold you in a very good state later on, especially when you are tackling very higher level question, which I, one higher level question I will do in the class today itself. Don't worry about that. Now, we have to prepare balance sheet because that is the ultimate idea. On the date of acquisition, we have to prepare the consolidated financial statement. I'm writing here balance sheet. It means consolidated balance sheet. So consolidated balance sheet I have to prepare. Is it clear to you? So in order to prepare the consolidated balance sheet, what I'm supposed to do? See here, in order to prepare the consolidated, what we mean by consolidation? Consolidation simply refers to the act of combining assets and liabilities of both the entities, correct? Because in the consolidated picture, in the consolidated balance sheet, we have to reflect the entire picture of the group. So that is why here, in order to prepare the consolidated balance sheet on the date of acquisition, some of you have already done in the 110, kindly don't confuse, correct, with the methodology of preparing consolidated financial financials. Here we are talking about on the date of acquisition, how we have to prepare consolidated balance sheet. So in order to prepare the consolidated balance sheet, another important point is that now make it a habit of what we call preparing the balance sheet as per the what we call demands of the examination. You know that all those entities which follow India's, they will have to prepare their financial statement as per division two, as per division two, correct? So when we prepare the balance sheet as per division two, first of all, we write assets. First of all, we write assets. Is it clear to you? We are preparing balance sheet as per division two. When we write assets, and you know better than again I, that first of all, we write non-current assets. Under the non-current asset, we write, first of all, property, plant and equipment. Kindly know me, kindly tell me, no. what, is the, what is the amount of property, plant and equipment of what we call uh, acquirer entity and acquiry entity. If you will look into the column of acquirer entity, you will see that I have written over there 30 lakhs. So in order to prepare the consolidated balance sheet, all I need to do is simply combine the respective items which are appearing in the balance sheet. It is as simple as that. So 30 lakh, 
property plant and equipment of acquirer entity and of acquiry entity it is 15 lakh it is 15 lakh so we can say that in the consolidated amount of property plant and equipment will be equal to 45 lakh consolidated amount will be equal to 45 lakh is it clear to you then because in i am intentionally i am leaving one line then i am writing here no uh, current assets after non current asset we will have to write current asset under the current asset first of all i will look into the column of acquirer entity now acquirer entity's current asset i think 5 lakh and then i will take into account the current assets of the acquiry entity now current assets of acquiry entity given in the question or given in the demonstration question you can say is 10 lakh that is equal to 15 lakh however you need to understand that when you are going to prepare the balance sheet whenever you are going to prepare the balance sheet here you will also write goodwill don't forget to write goodwill because you computed goodwill as rupees 3 lakhs so it will also get reflected in the balance sheet is it clear to you so now we can say safely that balance sheet total of asset side will be equal to i think 63 lakhs so this is how you are going to prepare the consolidated uh, balance sheet on the date of acquisition this balance sheet is being prepared on 1 4 2026 correct the date on which you got hold of or control of other enterprise now equity and liability equity and liability under equity and liability first of all we always write what equity we write equity under equity we write a share capital share capital and here you have to exercise a bit of caution whenever in the consolidated balance sheet whenever you are going to prepare the consolidated balance sheet only and only share capital of acquirer entity will figure share capital of acquiry entity you are not going to write it over here why you are not going to write it over here I told you only the share capital of acquirer entity you will write while preparing the consolidated balance sheet and share capital of acquiry entity will not be taken into account that when this capital of acquiry entity will not figure in the what we call consolidated balance sheet. Why? The reason is that because we have already used this share capital for computing net assets you can see here share capital of subsidiary company and even other equity have already been used for some computational work so whatever item which you have already used you need not require to present those item in the consolidated financial statement is it clear to you only the share capital only the share capital of acquirer entity will find place in the balance sheet now kindly let me know what is the amount of share capital of acquirer entity that is 10 lakh it is 10 lakh no doubt about that but but let me clarify here when i was writing the entry see here when i'm writing the entry my first entry is actually this one which i passed earlier correct property plant and equipment account debit current asset account debit two liability two consideration and two nci Actually, you must understand that instead of consideration, I could have written here share capital because in order to discharge the consideration, I am issuing share capital. So you read consideration as share capital because in the entry we have written share capital indirectly. It means the acquirer entity has issued further 12 lakh worth of share capital. Now, if acquirer entity has issued further 12 lakh worth of share capital, that means total share capital of acquirer entity now will be equal to 22 lakh here we are not writing the share capital of the acquiry entity only the share capital of acquirer entity but now the share capital of acquirer entity is equal to 22 lakh why it is 22 lakh because they have issued 12 lakh worth of share capital to the what we call uh, acquiry entity is it clear to you or not right sir I hope till up to this particular point everything is clear to each one of you. Is it clear to you how we do accounting actually in order to prepare the consolidated financial statement? 
Then besides that, I'm going to write here other equity. Just a moment ago, I told you when I'm going to write the other equity, again, I'm going to take into account only other equity of acquirer entity. I will not, I will not use the other equity of the acquiring entity. Why? Because share capital and other equity of the other entity, other entity means acquiring entity, have already been used somewhere else. If you have already used some item of the acquiring entity, you are not going to put those item in the consolidated financials. Is it clear to you or not? So equity, other equity, only 5 lakh we are going to write here. So while preparing the consolidated financial statement, only these two points you need to keep in your mind that share capital and other equity of what we call acquiring entity will not find place in the consolidated balance sheet. Is it clear? Then after that, what we are supposed to do, then we are going to write here. But before I write, let me also tell you that under equity, correct, we write share capital, other equity, and we also write NCI. NCI. The amount of NCI is 6 lakh. NCI is not, NCI is written under equity, but it is written as a separate line item. It is always written as a separate line item. So don't forget to write. So goodwill and NCI will figure in consolidated balance sheet. You need to understand that also. After that, you are going to write the amount of liability. Simply add the respective figures of liabilities. So as far as liabilities are concerned, what is the amount of liability I have forgotten? That is 20 lakh and 10 lakh. So 20 lakh of acquirer entity and 10 lakh of acquiry entity. So that is equal to 30 lakh. That is equal to 30 lakh. This is how, this is how we have to prepare. Now kindly total them up also. Is this total is 63 lakh or not? I think it is. So you must have understood now actually how the accounting is done and how the consolidated financial statements are prepared. How the consolidated financial statement are prepared on the date of acquisition. The first part is not yet over. <laughs> Correct? We are taking over a little bit of break. Now five minutes of break. I will take a cup of tea also. I will continue. Today's session is still on. And remember one thing. In today's session, I will do some lengthy questions also. In today's session itself. You have to show a bit of patience. So, five minutes of break. After that, we will meet. Correct?
So welcome again. After the break, hope each one each one of you are still present and if some of your friends have left, kindly call them back. Because we are proceeding towards something else and these are very vital these are very vital things which you need to understand. Correct? Just a moment ago, I wrote this particular question, whereby, just give me, just give me one second, one second only. First, let me raise it out. Correct? So, this is the data before you. Just a moment ago, I told you there are two companies, A and B company, and their data is given to you, and this information is given to you below, that on 1-4-2026, A Limited acquired 60% stakes in B Limited, and pays a consideration of rupees 12 lakh. Correct? Now suppose, now suppose I keep this particular data intact. I keep this particular data intact. This is demonstration too. This data is intact. Correct? Now here actually I am adding something. Same information which I gave you earlier is also given here but with only difference is that now I write fair value that means below it is given on 1-4-2026 A Limited acquired 60% stakes in B Limited and pays consideration of rupees 12 lakh. Now besides that you are being given some information like this. The information is fair value, fair value of property, plant and equipment is let us say 17 lakh fair value of property, plant and equipment is 17 lakh. So I am just adding more information to the one which I just, which I just actually gave earlier. Correct? This is continuation. Same data, same information. Now I am giving you one additional information whereby I am giving you some fair value. Fair value of property, plant and equipment is 17 lakh and let us say fair value of current assets is equal to 12 lakh, is equal to 12 lakh. Actually, now I am receiving my tea to be very honest with you. Well, it is appearing like a nectar because we are having very high fever today. Correct? That is why not in my full element, but Esther. And let us say fair value of liabilities. Liability in the balance sheet is 10 lakh. So, I keep the fair value as 7 lakh. So, this time I have added one more information. Is it clear to you? Then I add another information that con there is a contingent liability of B Limited. Contingent liability of B Limited, contingent liability of B Limited having fair value, having fair value, having fair value, let us say of rupees 1 lakh. So same data correct balance sheet of A and B limited is given to you. It is also given that company A has acquired 60% stakes in entity B and pays consideration of 12 lakh and one more information that fair value of three items property, plant and equipment, current asset and liability this time is given in the question but besides that you are also being given that contingent liability is there of B limited and it is having a fair value of 1 lakh obviously contingent liability is not recorded by B limited because it consider it as a contingent liability contingent liability means it is a present obligation where entity feels, feels that chances of outflow of funds are remote correct that is why they are not considering it as a proper liability. So, contingent liability is always written below the balance sheet as you know better than I. Then one more information I add. NCIE NCI to be computed NCI to be computed at fair value to be computed at fair value so what does it mean? I will let you know all these things. Correct? So in this particular data, I have added this information. So this time, how we are going to prepare the consolidated financial statement? So how we are going to prepare the consolidated financial statement? In order to prepare the consolidated financial statements, first of all, I need to know who is the accounting acquirer. Accounting acquirer will be A. What is the date of acquisition? Date of acquisition will be this one only. What is the amount of purchase consideration? That is equal to 12. After these three points, now point number four, under point number four, you will have to prepare an 
analysis table as I told you earlier. But because in this question, some information with respect to what we call fair value of the items is given. So your fourth step will instead of directly computing the or directly preparing the analysis table. Now, first of all, what you are going to do, you will write here fair value changes. You will take into account now fair value changes, fair value changes. Now you are in this particular step, fourth step will be related to computation of fair value changes whenever there will be some fair values in the question. Because in the last question there were no fair value information so that is why we directly proceeded to prepare analysis table. But now in this particular question we have fair value so we have to compute the fair value change. Now you have to take into account the changes in fair value. For example, property plant and equipment of B limited as you can see is 15 lakh but it is having a fair value of 17 lakh so there is a gain of 2 lakh so I will write here plus 2 lakh plus 2 lakh now current assets as far as current assets are concerned current assets were 10 lakh in the balance sheet but they are having a fair value of 12 lakh again there is up valuation again there is a gain and there is a gain of 2 lakh is it clear to you or not? There is a gain of 2 lakh. Correct. And now regarding liability. Liability was 10 lakh. Now the fair value of the liability is 7 lakh. Actually this time the fair value is lower than the value given in the balance sheet. But it is related to liability. That means the value of liability is falling down. So it is again a gain for you. It is again a gain for you. Don't misinterpret it correct because it is a liability a liability in the balance sheet of what we call acquiry company is written at 10 lakh but you will record them at 7 lakh so it's a gain for you so you will write here again plus 3 lakh and regarding contingent liability I told you this item is not appearing in the balance sheet of B limited in spite of that because under business combination acquirer company which is obtaining the control will have to take over this particular liability irrespective of probability of outflow of funds. They will consider it as a liability. They will consider it as a liability. Now the point is that no item is written in the balance sheet towards the liability side of B limited as contingent liability but still you are taking it as a liability so it is a sort of loss for you. That is why contingent liability will always be treated as a loss. Is it clear to you because you are taking over contingent liability so it is an additional liability unnecessarily you will have to take and the fair value of contingent liability is 1 lakh. So 4 plus 3, 7 minus 1, that comes to actually 6 lakh. That means there is a fair value gain of 6 lakh in this particular question. There is a fair value gain in this particular question to the extent of what we call 6 lakh. Is it clear to you? Now, under step number 5, in this particular question, after having determined the what we call who is accounting acquirer, after having determined who is, what is the date of acquisition, what is the amount of purchase consideration, we have computed fair value changes. Now I will prepare the analysis table. Now we will prepare the analysis table. Under analysis table, the basic intention is that we intend to know actually the amount of net assets. So analysis table. You will write here analysis table and in the analysis table we write on the date of acquisition on the date of acquisition what is the amount of share capital the amount of share capital if you will look into the balance sheet which I have just put before you the amount of share capital is actually 5 lakh and amount of other equity is 10 lakh because same data is there so now we can prepare the analysis table when I will prepare the analysis table I will write the amount of share capital as 5 lakh amount of share capital is 5 lakh. Then I will write here other equity. Other equity of acquiry entity is equal to 10 lakh. Now here you have to understand very, you have to understand and take care of this item fair value change. Now fair value change is finally positive. That means now a fair value reserve is getting created. This 6 lakh will be considered as fair value reserve. It will be considered as fair value reserve. It is a sort of gain. 
that mean on the date of acquisition directly or indirectly now there is a balance in fair value reserve as you know all the reserves are considered as part of other equity although you can write them separately so fair value reserve you will have to now write also because it is part of other equity itself so 6 lakh i will write now are you getting my point or not so on the date of on the date of acquisition now we can say the net assets of what we call subsidiary company is equal to this much i think it is coming to 21 lakh so total net assets of subsidiary of what we call acquiry company on the date of acquisition is equal to 21 lakh is it clear to you or not how we have computed it now now the next step is as i told you we have to bifurcate these net assets into two segments what part of net asset belong to nci and what part belong to actually parent company so in order to know what part of 21 lakh belongs to nci what i do see here out of 21 lakh worth of net assets what is the share of nci what is the share of nci kindly let me know of that first of all you let me know of what is the percentage of nci what is the percentage of nci in this particular case 40% but unlike the previous question unlike the previous question where we simply took 40% of net assets as value of nci in this question i am not going to take 40% of 21 lakh because in earlier case i adopted psna approach that mean this standard says that nci can be determined either through psna approach that is proportionate share of net assets approach or th through fair value approach is it clear to you those among you who are doing it first time need to take care of this particular aspect that nci can be determined by adopting proportionate share of net assets approach or through fair value approach correct when we take the proportion of the net assets correct nci proportion is 40% in the last in the last demonstration i computed nci in this manner so that method is not known as psna method proportionate share of net assets method but in this particular question it is written that nci need to be computed at fair value so it is important to understand that you have to look into the question carefully whether there is any direction with respect to computation of nci if there is no direction i will always advise you to use proportionate psna method use proportionate share of net sx method as we adopted in the last question but if there is a direction in the question then you simply cannot ignore it isn't it or not so in this case actually there is some direction and direction is that we have to compute nci as per fair value approach so how to compute the value of nci as per fair value approach in order to compute the value of nci as per fair value approach nci as per fair value as per fair value approach as per fair value approach so nci as per fair value approach will be equal to how much see here how to compute fair value first of all try to find out how much how many stakes are being acquired by acquirer entity acquirer entity is acquiring 60% stakes of total total stakes of b limited whatever total share capital of b limited is there we are acquiring 60% stakes now you just imagine that you are company b you are company b and value of your share capital is 5 lakh and i am acquiring 60% of your share capital that mean indirectly i am acquiring your 3 lakh worth of share capital does it mean that you are going to demand only 3 lakh rupees from me you are not going to demand 3 lakh from me you will tell me that this is the fair value of our share in the market this is whatever fair value this is the fair value of our share capital in the market a kindly pay us 60% of that amount that been in this question it is given that in order to get 60% share capital we have paid 12 lakh rupees 
we have paid 12 lakh rupees this 12 lakh is nothing but fair value that means for 60 percent share we are paying a consideration of 12 lakh or directly or indirectly it means fair value of 60 percent stake is equal to 12 lakh so what will be the fair value for 40 percent stakes because nci is 45 40 percent so this is how you are going to determine the what we call value of nci as per fair value approach is it clear to you so as per fair value approach now the value will be 40 percent into 12 lakh divided by 60 lakh divided by 60 lakh so this is how you are going to determine the value of nci as per fair value approach now as per fair value approach we can say that nci is equal to 8 lakh is it clear to you is it clear to everyone i hope it is i hope it is clear to everyone kindly let me know of that this time we have computed nci so point you need to understand that NCI can be computed as per PSNA approach and as per what we call fair value approach. This is complete prerogative of acquirer entity. Acquirer company has a choice whether they want to value NCI as per PSNA approach or as per fair value approach. However, you have to go by the what we call information given in the question. However, if there is no information given in the question, you have the choice to compute the NCI either through PSNA approach or through, through fair value approach. However, my advice is to use PSNA approach. But if the question clearly specifies that uh, we have to actually take into account fair value, so with this is how we are going to determine the fair value of NCI. Once you have determined the value of the NCI, only after having determined the value of the NCI, then only determine the value of parent share. Now we can find out here acquirer's share of net assets. Now what will be acquirer's share of net assets? Acquirer's share of net assets. How you are going to find that? Acquirer's share of net assets. Never commit this mistake of computing acquirer's share of net asset directly directly means 60 per you will you might think or you might tempt to think actually that their share is 60 percent so we should take directly 60 percent of 21 lakh this folly and this dreaded mistake you need to avoid correct always first compute the share of nci after having computed the share of nci subtract it from the total net asset because total net assets on the date of acquisition is equal to 20 lakh and out of 21 lakh we have plucked out 8 lakh rupees because that is the share of nci so whatever we are left up with now the remaining amount 21 lakh minus 8 lakh will be considered as 13 lakh and it will be considered as share of net assets of acquirer so remaining amount that is 13 lakh 21 lakh total net assets we have subtracted now we have subtracted what we call out of 21 lakh 8 lakh share of nci so remaining net assets or remaining part will be considered as share of acquirer is it clear to you or not now after having computed step number five now we move over to step number six under step number six we are going to compute the amount of goodwill correct so now we are in a position to compute the amount of goodwill or for that instance gain on bargain purchase when we say goodwill gain on bargain purchase also we need to write gain on bargain purchase so in order to compute goodwill or gain on bargain purchase always first of all write consideration total consideration is given in the question as 12 lakh now from it you subtract share of acquirer share of acquirer in the net assets share of acquirer in net assets in net assets of actually we have to write all these things in net assets of acquiry so net assets of acquiry are 21 lakh and share of acquirer in that happens to be 13 lakh now this time what you have noticed you have paid less then what you are getting you are getting 13 lakh worth of net assets however you are making a payment of 12 lakh only so this time it is a gain for you this time it is a gain for you and this gain will be considered as gain on bargain purchase gain on bargain purchase so this time you are having a gain on bargain purchase is it clear to you now <clears throat> 
we, I will prepare the <coughs> consolidated balance sheet. Now when I am going to prepare the consolidated balance sheet, I need to be careful. Consolidated balance sheet. When I will prepare the consolidated balance sheet, as usual, first of all, I will write assets. Under the assets, I will write first of all one non-current asset. Under the non-current asset, I will write a property, plant and equipment. Now, first of all, you take into account the property, plant and equipment of acquirer. Now, if you will look into the balance sheet, property, plant and equipment of acquirer is equal to 30 lakh, is equal to 30 lakh. However, this time you are taking over property, plant and equipment of what we call entity B at fair value. So don't take the balance sheet value of the acquiry entity. You will have to take the fair value. And the fair value was 17 lakh. So this is the point which you need to take care of. Now you will add the fair value of property, plant and equipment of acquiry entity. So you will write here 47 lakh. <clears throat> you will write here 47 lakh. Is it clear to you or not? then don't forget to write goodwill in case if there is goodwill however in this particular question there is no goodwill because there is gain on bargain purchase then after writing this we will write here current assets likewise you will write the current asset at book value of acquirer company items of acquirer company in the consolidated balance sheet will always come at carrying value correct However, you are going to take into account the fair value of the acquiry company. Now, fair value of current asset is given in this particular question, which happens to be, I think, 12 lakh. So, write here 12 lakh. So, now current asset, you will write 12 lakh and add it up. So, consolidated amount will be 17 lakh. Consolidated amount will be 17 lakh. If I will add these two items, I will get a total of, I think, 64 lakh. 64 lakhs. So total of asset side in this particular question is 64 lakh. Now I will write here liabilities, equity and liability, equity and liability. Under equity and liability, first of all, we write equity. Write here equity. Correct. You have written equity. Fine. Once you have written equity, now also write A, share capital. Under equity, first of all, we write share capital. But kindly, kindly, for God's sake, do not let it skip out of your memory that when we write here share capital, we take into account only the share capital of acquirer entity. Now, in the balance sheet, share capital of acquirer entity definitely is 10 lakh, but do not let it skip also that you are discharging a consideration of 12 lakh and for that you are issuing shares. So, total share capital after discharge of purchase consideration will be equal to 22 lakh. This is how the share capital of acquirer entity will appear in the consolidated balance sheet. Similarly, when you will write here other equity, under other equity, only, only acquirers other equity will appear and other equity of acquirer entity is 5 lakh. Share capital and other equity of acquiry entity will never ever figure in the consolidated balance sheet, correct, on the date of acquisition. Then I will also write here, see I am not writing here C because it is being presented as a separate li line item. So I will, and before that actually in this question there is gain on bargain purchase also. So I will write here gain on bargain purchase because gain on bargain purchase is a is an item of what we call other equity. So gain on bargain purchase was 1 lakh. So you must not forget to put it over here. Then you write here NCI. Amount of NCI which we computed is equal to 8 lakh. On the date of acquisition we computed NCI at fair value it was 8 lakh. Correct? And now I will write here liabilities. In this question liability of acquirer entity is 20 lakh but 7 lakh but 7 lakh is fair value of liability of acquiry entity 27 lakh and very very important very very important don't forget to write contingent liability you have taken over contingent liability and now you are going to record it as a liability 
This is the point you need to understand. Now you will total them up. I think it is coming to 64 lakh. So 64 lakh also. So on the date of acquisition, how we prepare consolidated balance sheet, I think it is clear to one and everyone now. And because it is clear to one and everyone, I hope it is clear to everyone how on the date of on the date of acquisition we prepare the consolidated balance sheet. Now kindly pay attention. Kindly pay attention towards the last question of these notes. Last question of this particular notes. You might be wondering, sir. Last question. Oh my God. In fact, page number, I will also tell you, I have kept a last section as highly advanced questions. Correct? Important and expected question. This is page number is 1.25. Page number 1.25, but uh, you open down, you will open, just wait, 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 right, <clears throat> page number 1.29, kindly open this particular page, kindly open this particular page and now I will do this question. This question is struck in what we call examination of June 23 new syllabus. Is it clear to you? I told you we are going to cover up. This is how. That is why I'm sh telling you that you have to show a bit of patience. Correct? Uh, unfortunately, just, just give me a second. Suddenly, just let me see. Actually, some blinkerings are there. So, let me see if I'm able to erase them or not. Just wait. Yes, it's okay now. Correct. So now pay attention towards this particular question 26, uh, sorry, 25.5. Now, in this particular question, it is given, given below are the extract of the balance sheet of S limited and P limited as at 31st of 3, 2023. Correct. <clears throat> now, some this information is given to you. We will see later on when I will read the question later on. In this particular question, P limited is going to be your acquirer entity. I have already told you acquirer entity is also known as parent entity. This is your acquirer entity. Later on, you will come to know about that. And this will be your acquiry entity. This will be your acquiry entity. This will be your acquiry entity. Clear? Now, if you will look carefully, there are two columns which are given in the question with respect to acquiry company. One is balance sheet value and another one is fair value. In the balance sheet, it is given that equity share capital is 8,000 and one share is of rupees 10 each and all the figures are in crores. Regarding acquiry company, right now actually I am going through. Then other equity of acquiry company is equal to 2,000. Then there are some items of liability like borrowings, trade payables and you must have noticed the fair value of borrowings is also given. Similarly, the fair value of trade payable is also given. Now you let me know if borrowing given in the balance sheet is 2000 and their fair value is 2050, is it a gain or loss to you? It is going to be a gain to you. Is it a gain? It is a loss to you because liability is increasing. Now if liability is increasing, it is a fair value loss to you. Similarly, 2500 is the amount of trade payable, but in case of trade payable, fair value is less. So it is a gain to you. The gain is equal to 100. Then we are being given property, plant and equipment. Property, plant and equipment is given as 9,000. Their fair, fair value is 10,000. That means there is a gain of 1,000. There is a gain of 1,000, isn't it or not? Then similarly, we are being given investment property. Investment property is one which is kept by an enterprise for the purpose of earning rental income or for the purpose of sale. That is known as investment property. India's 40 applies and India's 40 is not part of your course. Don't worry about that. Anyway, investment property given in the balance sheet is 5,000 and its fair value is 7,000. Again, there is a gain of 2,000. 
करेक्ट देन वी आर गिव वी आर बींग गिवन इन्वेस्टमेंट अवर कंपनी माइट हैव मेड सम इन्वेस्टमेंट सो इन्वेस्टमेंट वन थाउजेंड इज गिवन एंड नो फेयर वैल्यू इज गिवन फाइन इफ नो फेयर वैल्यू इज गिवन ऑलवेज परज्यूम डेट द फेयर वैल्यू इज इक्वल टू दी कैरिंग अमाउंट इज क्लियर टू यू और नॉट Now current assets are given three thousand five hundred. Their fair value is three thousand two hundred. In case of current asset, there is a loss of three hundred. Besides that, there is contingent liability. And now contingent liability they have written here. They have written here. So you might tend to think that subs that subsidiary company or acquiry entity has written contingent liability in the balance sheet. Don't commit this particular mistake. even though it is written in the column of what we call balance sheet you need to understand that contingent liability are never ever written in the balance sheet by the acquiring company correct so you presume that it is given in footnote you presume it is not given in the balance sheet just to confuse you in the examination they are going to present the information in such a manner so that you develop confusion and in order to test your knowledge so contingent liability you presume it is not an item of balance sheet number 1 now its fair value is 750 now you tell me the amount of loss or profit kindly let me know without having a look over the solution contingent liability i just told you a moment ago when through the demonstration in this case should i should i presume that fair value of contingent liability is falling so it is a gain or should i presume this 750 is entirely a loss so you must understand that in case of contingent liability whatever carrying value is given that is irrelevant for you you have to be concerned with only what we call fair value in the sense because this liability was not recorded by the acquiring entity and you are obtaining the control over the acquiring entity so you will have to now take over this this liability so this liability at whatever value you are going to take is a loss to you so that is the reason actually this will be considered entirely as a loss later on when you are going to compute the fair value loss or gain this is how you are going to take into account the values and these are the balance sheet value of what we call parent entity or acquirer entity so their share capital is 12000 their other equity is 4000 their borrowings are this much their liabilities and then there are assets investment property sorry property plant and equipment investment property then investment and current assets the, this is the information related to the acquirer entity is it clear to you or not i hope till up to this particular point things are clear and especially the point with respect to contingent liability in whenever contingent liability will be given in this manner you have to ignore the value which is given under the column of the balance sheet because contingent liabilities are never ever written under the balance sheet by the acquiry entity by, by the acquiry entity and you are going to take the contingent liability at fair value so this entire fair value will be considered as loss to you is it clear to you now in this question below it is given that market price of equity share of p limited and s limited are rupees 16 and 15 now in this question you are also being given the market price or market value of share of acquirer entity and acquiry entity because acquirer entity is p and s is what we call acquiry entity and respective prices of their share are given to us further it is given further it is given past general entries in the books of p limited in each of the following in each of the following cases actually this question contains some part the first part is that p limited acquired 75% stake in s limited on 31st of 3 2023 now somebody asked me if date of acquisition is at the end of the year should we use in days 103 or in days 110 because i am preparing consolidated financial statement first time because on this date we have got the control and on this date this is the first time we are preparing so on this date we have to adopt in days 103 is it clear to you number 1 p limited acquired 75% stakes in s limited on 31st of 3 2023 
and purchase consideration is settled by issue of 800 crore equity share for which no accounting effect has been given for which no accounting effect has been given it means that whatever shares which we have issued to you are not written in the balance sheet and even though if this particular line would not have been mentioned we would have always presumed that whatever share capital or amount of purchase consideration which we have discharged haven't yet been actually uh, incorporated in the balance sheet so main point in this particular question is first of all i have written here point number one degree of control you need not require to bother about that because it is clearly stated in the question that you have acquired 75 percent stake it means your control in the what we call acquiring entity is 75 percent over the net assets and 25 percent control is of what we call nci now date of control is 31st of 3 2023 now i told you you need to find out the amount of purchase consideration in this question purchase consideration is given but not given in a very clear manner it is given that purchasing com sorry acquirer entity acquirer entity is issuing 800 crore share so 800 crore share at what value because the market price of acquirer company is 16 so you will multiply 800 crore with 16 to know the amount of purchase considerations amount of purchase consideration is 12,800 is it clear to you or not is it clear to you fine sir it is clear to us till up to this point things are clear or not let me know after that now in this question i will do working for revaluation known as fair value changes i have already told you there is a loss with respect to borrowings there is a gain with respect to trade payable there is a gain with respect to investment property there is a loss with respect to current asset there is a gain with respect to property plant and equipment till up to this point we are getting a total positive figure of 2750 and contingent liability we have to subtract because it is a loss entire amount entire fair value will be considered as a loss purchase consideration in this question it is given that purchasing company is issuing 800 crore share we are issuing 800 i am the what we call purchasing company or acquirer entity whatever you may like to say correct is it clear to you Karthik Muldikram, if date of acquisition is at year end, we should use India's 103 if we are making, if we are preparing consolidated financial statement first time. On subsequent year end date, we always use India's 110. Subsequent, for example, next time when I am going to prepare, next year end, I will you have to use India's 110. Is it clear to you? Anyway, in this question, somebody asked me, Mahi Majdi, 800 crore share I am the I am the what we call acquirer entity. You are the acquirer entity. I am issuing 800 share, and market price of my share is 16. So obviously, I am going to discharge the consideration at market value. That is why purchase consideration will be considered as 12,800. After having computed the purchase consideration, now you have to take into account 2,000. Thank you for Karthik Burlitharan. I hope you have understood that particular point. Now, 2,000 is your net fair value gain. It is your net fair value gain. Now, we have to find out net assets on the date of acquisition. On the date of acquisition, in order to find out the net asset, what we are supposed to do? We have to take into account the share capital of acquiry entity. So you can look into the balance sheet. Their share capital is 8,000. You will also add other equity of what we call acquiry entity. Correct. And then fair value changes 2,000 rupees. So total net assets will be equal to 16,000. Once you have determined the amount of net assets on the date of acquisition, now find out the respective shares. Now in this question regarding NCI, they haven't mentioned anything. So I will use proportionate share of net assets method. 25% stakes of NCI, 25% of 16,000 will be 4,000. And then I will write 75% of 16,000 that comes to 12,000. So out of 16,000, 4,000 worth of asset belong to actual net asset belong to NCI and out of 16,000, 12,000 worth of net asset belong to actually P Limited. Now, now 
you can find out the amount of goodwill intentionally in the solution i haven't done this step actually there is no need for this particular step why i will tell you later on but first have a look over here amount of consideration what is the amount of consideration which we computed a minute ago that is 12800 800 crore share at the rate of 16 12800 is the amount of consideration now in order to find out goodwill and now i am going to subtract acquirer's share of net assets now what is the share of acquirer acquirer share of net assets now acquirer share of net asset is equal to 12000 you subtract 12000 so you can find out the amount of goodwill so amount of goodwill will be equal to 8 lakh because consideration exceeds the share of net asset so in this case goodwill although we know that we can find out the find out the amount of goodwill simply by passing the entry because in this particular question it is clearly stated that you have to pass only the entries actually this is the only solution this question demands so this entry this will be the entry which you are going to write but when you are going to write the entry take care of the fact that if there is a particular item and if its fair value is given record it at fair value for example fair value of current asset is given you will record it at fair value however fair value of investment is not given you will record them at carrying amount on the presumption that carrying amount is equal to the fair value is it clear to you that investment property 7000 property plant and equipment at fair value 10000 these are the assets then we will record the borrowings at fair value we will record all the liabilities that is trade payable 2400 then do not do not forget to write contingent liability 750 at fair value then you write here consideration payable which you have written 12800 right in bracket share capital also then two nci share of nci is 4000 through the entry we can take the balancing figure the balancing figure will be 800 this is how we have to in this particular question they have asked only to pass the entry and there are some other parts related to this particular question but you will be able to understand the other parts only once we know the treatment once we are acquainted with the concept of business acquisition achieved in strategies so for today i think this much is enough Although I was uh, not quite well, but I hope that I have been able to carry out my responsibility to your satisfaction. I do not know how uh, the class was and how did it come to your expectation or not. Kindly, kindly put up your feedbacks in the comment boxes and not in the chat boxes. Correct? Because chat boxes will get evaporated when you will write your comments in the chat box in the what we call comment boxes of the video then other people also come to know about that and that will help us and obviously we want actually that we should have a maximum reach to the students so that everyone get benefit out of these sessions looking forward to have your suggestion further kindly write your comment in the youtube boxes that's why you youtube comment boxes these are the chats you are making but these chat will get evaporated whatever you are writing here put up all these comments in the youtube comment boxes youtube comment boxes correct later on so looking forward to ha have another meeting with you and most probably tomorrow i will try if i'm well i will take the class tomorrow otherwise day after tomorrow surely i'm going to continue and next in the next session we'll finish up this particular and all the concept all the other concept this was the major concept which i wanted to discuss today correct and from this particular concept surely you are going to have the question in the upcoming examination mark it out mark it out today i'm ready to actually bet my hair on it correct although i have started losing my hair also but and begin the session to the day of the day without wasting much time uh, and uh, what we are going to start up with today but before we start up today let me ask you uh my mom absolutely fine let me ask you one question let me see actually how well you are able to actually cope up with the sessions and every day i'm going to put up some question before i'm going to start the session now you let me know listen to my question first of all first of all listen to my question the first question of the day is actually suppose a limited has taken over all the assets and liabilities of b limited suppose a limited has taken over all the assets and liabilities of B limited. Now my question is, in this case, how many financial statement, how many financials shall A limited will have to prepare? If you have listened to the last lecture quite well, you should be in a position to deliver answer to this particular question. Lovely good evening, obviously, Goel, Prafulla, Pati Joshi, and uh, 
Satpati, Vinay Kumar and all those who have just joined us in Nivas and Rajagopalan also. Yes, my question to you is, if suppose A Limited has acquired all the assets and liabilities of B Limited, my question is, how many financial statement in this case A Limited will have to prepare? That means I'm asking whether A Limited need to prepare separate financial statement in consolidated financial statements or not. I should say one statement, which one? Right, very nice answer. Uh, mostly the answers which I have started getting now are absolutely correct. Yes, only one financial statement that is separate financial statement in this case because we are taking over all the assets and liabilities. I say, well, your answer is not correct. In the last session, we talked about this particular fact that we can get control over the other enterprise by taking over all their assets and liabilities. In such a situation, the existence of the other entity comes to an end and that's the reason actually we need to prepare only separate financial statement and in this case, no consolidated financial statement shall be needed. So that is the reason I am going to toss a question in between. But before uh, I start further uh, asking further question. Let me actually start today's this particular session. So in this particular session, first of all, I am going to start off with the concept. Which concept? Let me first of all come to that, and then I will let you know. The concept I am going to take up today to start the session is concept number. I think nine. It is. It is ten. Uh, this is given in your page number. What is the page number actually? In my notes, there are no page number, unfortunately. This is concept number 10. Concept number 10 we are picking up today. Correct? First to start the session. In between, I have written here concept number 8, identifying the acquiring enterprise. I have already talked about this one and determination of acquisition date. We have also talked about this one. But first of all, today we are going to pick up this particular topic. Business combination achieved in stages. Now, let me tell you and caution you and please pay attention kindly now. This particular topic I have written here important and you, those who know me, they know quite well that hardly ever I, all, I say in the class that this is going to be the most important one, most important one, nothing like that. But I am talking about this particular section. This is the most vital one, most important one, formidable one in the sense because we have noticed that since last four attempts, with great regularity and with great ferocity, questions are striking in, in the examination from this particular topic. Now, kindly pay attention. Correct? What we mean by business combination achieved in stages? You know that you can get the control over the other, other enterprise either through majority of the voting stake. For example, if you have got 75% voting stakes in the other entity, that means you are exercising the control. And as I just told a moment ago, you can also get hold of over other enterprise by acquiring their assets and liabilities. Correct? In both the situations, you are controlling the other enterprise. In fact, in the later one, actually, the existence of the other enterprise will come to an end. However, sometimes an enterprise gets control over the other enterprise by making additional investment. If some of you have forgotten this particular concept, let me actually come to the point. For example, let us say we have on this particular date and this particular date is let us say 1-7-2024. On 1-7-2024, on we presume that there is an entity by the name of A Limited and it acquires, let us say, 30% stakes in B Limited. Now, if A Limited has acquired 30% stakes in B Limited, quite obviously in this case, A is not having the control over the other enterprise. A Limited is having definitely the significant influence, but it is not having the control over the other enterprise. So that means other enterprise cannot be construed as our acquiry entity or as our subsidiary entity. So at this particular moment, all we can say that we are having significant influence over the other entity and other entities are associate entity. No doubt about that. Correct. Now in the other room, it seems actually our staff is having a little bit of noise. So in this case, I just talked about this particular fact that A Limited has got 30% stake. So I just said that we are exercising the significant influence. In this case, we are not having the control. Now, let us say on 1-7-2025, A Limited makes additional investment in this particular entity and let us say for, acquires further 35% stakes. Now, you can say by making the additional, additional investment, 
at a later date, now our total controlling interest in the other entity happens to be 65%. So in this case, control is accruing on this particular date. So when we have made the additional investment and control flows to us or accrues to us in that particular in that particular case, we say that this is a case of business combination, business combination achieved in stages and sometimes it is also referred to as step acquisition. It is also known as step acquisition. Now, why, why this particular topic is important? Because whensoever question comes from this particular topic, then in that particular case, you need to exercise a bit of caution as far as computation of goodwill is, con goodwill is con uh, concerned. Now, to make you understand this particular point, let's have a look over this particular question. I hope each one of you are having the notes. Now, just pay attention. Now, in this particular case, 12.1 is the question I'm picking up now. Here it is written that A Limited acquired 30% of entity B in 2021 for rupees 35,000. It is clearly stated in the question that you got control, sorry, you got 35% stakes in entity B Limited in 2021. In 2000, this is year 2021 and in year 2021 your stakes, your investment in B Limited is 35% and you acquired these 35% stakes in B Limited by making a payment of 35,000. This is the amount of purchase consideration. But as you know 35% stakes will not deliver you control over the other enterprise. Correct? Now further it it is written in the question, in 2022, fair value of shares of B Limited is 42,000, thus 7,000 is reported under OCI. Now see here, what does it mean? Now, at a later date, at a later date, in 2022, let us say, now next year what happens, question has given some information that the investment which was made by us in the investee entity in the previous year Correct. As you know, the investment is worth 35,000 worth of rupees and we have acquired 35% stakes in the other entity. Now in 2022, it is written in the question that fair value of shares of B Limited is rupees 42,000. The 7,000 is reported in 2022. Now, let us say we are A Limited and we have invested in B Limited. Now in year 2022, the first information which, which is given to us is that the value of our investment has gone up to 42,000. Quite obviously with the passage of the time, the value of the financial instrument changes. Financial instrument because we have acquired the shares. Shares are nothing but financial instruments. Isn't it or not? We have acquired 35% equity shares of the other entity for a payment of rupees 35,000. So value of, as you know, financial instrument changes with the passage of the time. Now in the next year it is reported, our value because 35% share we acquired for by, by making a payment of 35,000, but now its value is equal to 42,000. Now its value is equal to 42,000 means actually, if I am going to acquire same 35% share today, then I would have had to pay actually 42,000. So that means the value of your investment has gone up. Now pay attention, this is very important to understand and definitely you are going to get a question out of this particular section. You can take it in writing from my side. So that means the value of your investment has gone up by actually 7,000. Has gone up by 7,000, number one. Number two, you must also understand when you made the investment earlier, when you made the investment earlier, at that time you did not get the control. You made investment and you made investment for by paying rupees 35,000. You acquired 35% stakes, but you didn't get the control. However, Whatever investment which you have made in the other entity, you must have recorded that investment. You must have recorded that investment at fair value because generally the investment which we make in the other entity are recorded at fair value. Correct? So, as you know, there is a particular chapter financial instrument which deals with actually such investment. There is a separate chapter by the name of financial instrument and which is covered by India 109, India 107 and India 32. But the point why I'm talking about this particular chapter right now here is that because India 109 states that if an entity makes an investment in the other entity, generally such investment should be reflected because in that case it is considered as financial asset. 
The equity instruments are considered as financial assets and such investment must be recorded either at cost or at fair value. But NDS 9 states that such investments must be recorded at fair value only. NDS 109 states that such investments must be recorded at fair value. It means, it means this entity A Limited when it made the investment earlier, it must have recorded it at fair value. But, but. When, we, when you are going to study, and some of you have already studied financial instrument, you know under financial instrument, financial assets can be measured either at fair value through profit and loss account or fair value through other comprehensive income. These are the two terms which sometimes actually give unnecessary jitters to the student fraternity. While doing financial instrument, I had, in fact, during my regular classes, clarified that an entity can measure the investment in equity shares either through fair value, fair value through profit and loss account or through this particular concept fair value through other comprehensive income. FVTOCI means fair value through other comprehensive income or fair value through profit and loss account. What does it mean? Fa suppose as an entity, suppose I am the entity A limited and I have the choice. I can measure my investment as per this category or as per this category. That means I can put my investment in this category or in this category. It is completely my prerogative. It is my choice. It is my decision. Suppose our entity has already decided that we are going to put it into this particular category, FVTOCI. What does it mean? It means, first of all, the full, full form of FVTOCI is fair value through other comprehensive income. And put it in simple word, it means whatever changes will take place in the fair value of the investment, those changes will be reflected in other comprehensive income. And fair value through profit and loss account simply signifies that whatever changes would take place in the fair value, those will be reflected in profit and loss account. That is what we mean by FVTPL or FVTOCI. Is it clear to you? So, whenever an entity makes an investment in the other entity, in that case, investment is technically considered as financial asset as per India S109. And such financial assets are generally recorded at fair value. But it can be recorded either as fair value through profit and loss account or fair value through other comprehensive income. Is it clear to you? Now, here it is written in this particular case that this entity, when the value, when the fair value changed from 35,000 to 42,000, obviously there is an upward what we call trend. So it is written in the question that this entity has decided to take this 7,000 to the other comprehensive income. It is clearly written in the question. Is it clear to you or not? That means this entity whose investment has gone up from 35,000 to 7,000, it must have passed an entry at this particular moment. The entry must have been like this, investments, investments in B limited, investment in B limited account debit to other comprehensive income. Why I am writing other comprehensive income? Because it is clearly written in the question that this entity has taken this increment to the other comprehensive income. It means A Limited has elected for this particular category of measurement of financial asset. Is it clear to you? Is it clear to everyone? That means A Limited must have categorized its investment into this particular category. That is why it is taking the changes to the other comprehensive income. However, you have to be careful here. Sometime in the question, it is not given that where this profit has been reported. Sometime the question would be silent in the examination that where this entity has taken this profit to. Whether it has taken it to OCI or whether it has taken to what we call profit or loss account because entity has got a choice to measure the investment at FVTPL or FVTOCI. Now, if in the question it is not given, always presume that entity is measuring the investment as per FVTPL. If the question is silent, suppose if in, the, if in this particular question, this line would not have been there that 7000 has been reported towards the OCI. Suppose if this particular line would not have been given in the question, then what entry I would have had passed? Where I would have taken the profit? 
I would have taken the profit to profit and loss account because in that particular case, I would have had presumed that this entity is measuring it FVTPL because generally the investments are measured in this category that is fair value through profit and loss account. However, entity has a choice to measure their investment or financial instrument, especially the investment and equity instruments uh, in FVTOCI also. Is it clear to you? I hope it is absolutely clear. Right, right, absolutely. By default, you will have to consider uh, Rahul, de definitely, that's well said in fact. So by default, it's a it's far better word. By default, you will always presume that it is taken to the FVTPL category. In that case, I would have had passed the entry investment in B limited account debit to profit and loss account. Number one. Now we move to other part. A further 40% stakes in B limited were acquired. That meaning year 2022, two things are happening. Number one. First of all, it is given that uh, value of our previous investment has gone up to 42,000. Then another information is delivered in the question. Let me create a bit of space for me. Right. Now it is given in the question that this entity acquired further 40% stakes in B Limited. Let us say on this particular date, further 40% stakes have been acquired. Presume this is the date on which you acquired further 40 percent the moment you are going to get further 40 percent what will happen what will happen now due to this additional investment this is the additional investment ai it does not stand for artificial intelligence See, this is for additional investment correct so we acquired further 40 percent stakes now what will happen control will control will accrue to us so that may now our stakes in total are 75% in the other entity and now we are the acquirer entity or the parent entity or the holding company and other entity which was earlier our associate now will become our what we call acquiry company or what we call subsidiary company because on this date now control has, has been acquired by us. Is it clear to you? Number one. Number two, further it is written in the question. Now see here, just to confuse you, it is also written that First of all, it is also written that you acquired further 40% stakes by paying 60,000 rupees. Further 40% you acquired by paying a purchase consideration of 60,000 rupees. It is also given in the question. Correct? Now, it is written, Entity A identifies the net assets of B Limited at 1,20,000. Now, pay attention. What does it mean? On the date of control, and control you got because of further 40% investment you paid for further 40% investment you made a payment of what we call 60,000 and further it is written that on this particular date net identifiable asset in short form I am writing NIFA net identifiable asset of our acquiry company B limited is equal to 120,000 is equal to 120,000 this is also given in the question now another line which could give us a little bit of problem is value of 35% shares is rupees 45,000. Value of our 35% share means question is talking about our previously held investment. Now this investment will be known as previously held investment PIH previously held investment. It will be known as previously held investment. This is your additional investment. Now question states that value of 35% share is rupees 45,000. What does it mean? Indirectly, it means on the date of control, on the date of control, your investment has moved to 45,000. Your investment has moved to 45,000. It has already moved to 42,000. Your original investment was for rupees 35,000. In the, let us say in the beginning or somewhere before what we call making additional investment, your earlier investment was found to be worth rupees 42,000. That means its value moved up by 7,000. So you pass that particular entry to incorporate the fair value change. Now, because the value of investment is now moving up from what we call 42 to 45, that means there is a further increment of 3,000. There is a further increment of 3,000. If there is a further increment of 3,000, what will I will do? I will have to pass the same entry again. So I will have to pass the same entry again. The entry will be investment in B limited account. Once again, you will repeat the entry. And because it is given in the question that entity has elected for FET OCI. So whatever increment in will be there, I will take it to other comprehensive income. 
Are you getting my point or not? I hope till up to this particular point of time, everything is clear to everyone. So first of all, whenever there will be a case of business combination achieved in stages, you will have to take care of your changes in the fair value of your original investment, better known as previously held investment. Is it clear to you or not? So if there would be any changes prior to getting the control, all those changes need to be incorporated. Number one. Now number two. Under such circumstances, we will have to compute the goodwill. Now, in order to compute the goodwill, calculation of goodwill should not be a very big task, but it could become a little bit tricky, especially under such situations. Now, because we have got the control on this particular date, we have got the control on this particular date, and on this particular date, we got control by making 40% of uh, what we call further stake, uh, by acquiring 40% further st stakes and we paid 60,000. And on this particular date, it is also given, that means this will be now considered as date of acquisition because on this particular date, we are getting the control. So on the date of acquisition, I need to find out what we call goodwill also, as we have seen in the last session. And in order to find out the goodwill, we need to know the net assets of B Limited or our acquiry company on the date of acquisition, which is given in the question that happens to be 1,20,000. So, first of all, I'm going to simply record NIFA. NIFA means net identifiable assets of B Limited. Net identifiable assets of B Limited on the date of acquisition, on the date of acquisition. On the date of acquisition, net identifiable assets of B Limited, how much? That is given 1,20,000. First of all, you will have to record the what we call net identifiable assets. After noting them down, what we need to do now? On the date of acquisition, your acquiry is having net assets to the tune of 1,20,000. Now, out of this 1,20,000, I will have to pluck out the share of NCI. I will have to pluck out the share of NCI. First of all, you let me know on the date of acquisition when you got control. How did you got control? Because on this particular date, now you are having 75% stake. If you are having 75% stake, it is quite natural now that NCI must be having what we call 25% stakes. Isn't it or not? It is as simple as that. So when I am saying now, after noting down the net identifiable assets of what we call uh, B Limited or the acquiry entity, now you have to pluck out the share of NCI. Now, what will be the share of NCI? Could anyone of you let me know? NCI. I told you NCI value can be found out through proportionate share of net assets basis or by way of fair value. Number one. If question would be silent, always go for PSNA approach. Unless and until question specifically asks you to compute NCI on fair value basis, unless and until. Till that particular time, always go for PSNA approach. In this question or in this case study, it is not written that NCI need to be measured at fair value. So we are adopting PSNA approach. Now, as per PSNA approach, I have to take the percentage of the NCI correct and simply multiply it with the what we call value of net assets. So value of net assets on the date of acquisition as you can see is 120 and your share will be equal to 30,000. So out of 120,000 worth of assets we can safely now say that not 30,000 worth of asset belong to NCI. Is it clear to you? Now, now remaining asset will belong to acquirer no doubt about that. So acquirer share of asset. So remaining asset will be how much? acquirer share of net assets. So acquirer share of net assets will be equal to 90,000 without an iota of doubt, isn't it or not? Acquirer share of net assets is 90,000. Generally, in order to compute the goodwill, what we do? Generally, in order to compute the goodwill, we simply compare the amount of consideration with the what we call share of net assets, share of net assets of acquirer entity, share of net assets of acquirer. By comparing these two, we can safely find out what is the amount of goodwill. But under such situation where the control will accrue to the acquirer entity through additional investment, under such circumstances, we cannot directly now compare consideration with the share of net asset to determine the amount of goodwill. Is it clear to you? Because you need to understand here very carefully, and this is very important. Out of this 90,000, no doubt parent is having what we call control over the 90,000 worth of net assets. 
total net assets of acquiry entity 120 without an iota of doubt acquirer is having control over 90,000 worth of assets without any doubt is it clear to you but if you will look very closely into this particular question you earlier had 35% worth of stakes in this particular entity correct that mean that mean no doubt about that parent is getting a share of 90,000 worth of net assets but some portion of share of net asset is flowing towards the parent company on account of previously held investment are you getting my point or not what my point is parent is definitely having what we call stakes of 75 percent and we are having what we call 90,000 worth of proportionate assets under our fold but point which we need to understand is that we made investment earlier 35 percent worth of investment was made by us earlier so because we had made earlier some investment so some portion of the net assets are flowing to us because of our previously held investment what my point is after what we call determining the what we call share of acquirer in the net assets on the date of acquisition under what we call business combination achieved in stages what you need to do further is that first of all you try to find out right here previously held investment right here previously held investment and what is the current value of your previously held investment now it is given in the question that on the date of acquisition value of your previously held investment is 45,000 now it means now it means whatever net assets whatever net assets which are flowing towards the parent out of those 90,000 worth of assets parent is getting a share because of our previously held investment and now we have found out because of previously held investment now we can say that parent share in the net asset is 45,000 total share of parent in the net asset is 90,000 out of this 90,000 45,000 worth of share parent is able to get or acquirer is able to get because of previously held investment because value of your previously held investment is now 45,000 value of previously held investment now 45,000 means now you have got control over 45,000 worth of assets so whenever you are going to acquire one uh Thank you so much. Anyway, now whenever I'm teaching in between, you try to avoid messaging, correct? Because sometimes otherwise flow gets uh, break. Now the point here is that total share of parent in the what we call net assets on the date of acquisition, 90,000, number one. But this 90,000 is because of 75% stakes. But out of this 75%, we are getting some share because of our previously held investment. And our previously held investment is 35%. But their fair value is 45,000. Their fair value is 45,000 means because of my 35% previously held investment, I'm getting a share of 45,000 worth of net assets. Now I will deduct this 45,000 from this 90,000. Now this 45,000, what does this 45,000 will reflect? This 45,000 will reflect, this is the share of acquirer, no doubt, but because of additional investment. Because of additional investment, we got hold of only 45,000 worth of net asset. Now it means, is it clear to you or not? Is it clear to everyone? So whenever, whenever there would be a case of business combination achieved in stages, under such circumstances, you will have to note down first of all total net assets on the date of the acquisition number one as usual you will always pluck out the share of the nci the remaining asset definitely will belong to the acquirer but now you cannot directly compare it with the consideration because in these net assets some share is flowing to us because of our previously held investment previously held investment what is the share in the net assets on account of previously held investment for that you need to know what is the fair value of the previously held investment on the date of acquisition so that fair value is 45 that mean out of 90,000 I am getting 45,000 because of my earlier investment actually I am interested what share I am getting on account of additional investment now I have determined that because of my additional investment I got a share of 45,000 because of my additional investment correct 
and for additional investment i have made a consideration of 60000 because this consideration is for additional investment so this is the consideration for additional investment so quite obviously you would love to know because of additional investment how much share actually you got you got 45000 so that is why the difference will be considered as goodwill because amount of consideration is more is it clear to you or not? So under business combination achieved in stages, you need to understand how you are going to compute the amount of goodwill I have clearly given in the question, correct? In detailed solution, with detailed solution. So you should not confront any difficulty now in understanding this particular concept. This is very, very important concept from the examination point of view. And I will prove it just in a moment why it is. Now, after having done this concept, let me take you a little bit further. Now, move over to the last section of this particular chapter. Again, correct? Lot of zigzagging we have to do. Now, this is your uh, pace number. Where is the pace number? Pace number, uh, I do not know. Uh, 1.29. This is pace number 1.29 once again. And in pace number, in fact, in fact, before that, before that, I will take you towards this particular concept. Uh, come to pace number. This is your pace number 1.28. In pace number 1.28, question number two. In pace number 1.1.28, right? 1.28. Have a look over question number two. I hope now the question is before you. Is it clear? See, I have written, I have collaborated some very important questions. I think this section belongs to very important questions. Correct? Among those important questions, I'm picking up question number two. Just pay attention here. Company A and B is in power business. Company A and B are in power business and company A holds 25% of equity shares of company B. Company A and B are in power business and company A holds 25% equity share. Pay attention actually. As per the information given in this particular question, company A is having just about 25% stakes. 25% stakes. What does it mean? B company is our acquiring company. Doesn't if suppose I am going to ask you what is the relationship between A and B at this particular moment? Quickly give me answer. What is the relationship between this particular group A and B? Is this relationship is of acquirer or acquiry, parent or subsidiary or what else? We have got hold of only 25% stakes in other entity. When you get hold in between 20 to 50%, what did I tell last time? That means other entity will be our associate entity. So that means at this particular moment, B Limited is not our acquiry company. The important point is that. Correct? We are investor entity. Right. Thank you so much. Nice to see people are recapping the thing. So B Limited is our associate entity and we are exercising significant influence. Correct? Well, further it is written, on 1-11-2024, A obtains control of B Limited when it acquires further 65% of company's B share, thereby resulting in a total holding of 90%. So in this question, it is written that later on, an exact date is also given. The date is 1-11-2024. So on 1-11-2024, it is stated in the question that we acquired further 65% stakes in B Limited. First of all, let me know. Only give me answer to that question which I am asking. Correct? First of all, you let me know actually what on this date, what will happen? We will become acquirer entity. Now we are acquirer or parent entity. Correct? A Limited will become acquirer and B Limited will be our acquiry entity. Number one, this particular date will be considered as date of acquisition because on this date control is being acquired by us. Is it clear to you? On this date we have acquired the control. So our total stakes in B Limited will become 25% uh, plus 65. It is already given in the question 90%. On the date of acquisition, if we are having what we call 90% 90 90 control, quite obviously, the proportionate share of NCI will be, proportionate share of NCI will be 10%. Correct? Now we move further. It's very important question. Pay attention. Here it is written, company A transfer cash of 59 lakh rupees. Yesterday or in the last session, should I say, 
I talked about purchase consideration and art I talked about this particular fact that purchase consideration correct generally you will not be asked to compute the amount of purchase consideration but sometimes sometime on rare occasions you may be asked especially in small questions for example in this case it is given a transfer cash of 59 lakh right so company a is giving a cash of rupees 59 lakh 59 lakh will be considered as part of purchase consideration without an iota of doubt 59 lakh Further, it is given that A Limited is also issuing 1 lakh shares on 1-11-2024. So, on 1-11-2024, Company A has uh, uh, issues, uh, is issuing 1 lakh shares and the market price of share of Company A is rupees 10 per share. Okay, So, total share capital issued by Company A is equal to how much share capital? 1 lakh share of rupees 10 each. So 1 lakh share, total 1 lakh share and 1 share is of rupees 10 each, that will be equal to 10 lakh. That will be equal to 10 lakh. Correct? Further it is, and there is one more line and let me explain this line also. Otherwise you may think actually why I skipped this particular line. The equity share issued as per the transaction will comprise 5% of the post acquisition equity capital of A. What does it mean? Just for your knowledge sake, because as a professional student, you need to be aware of all such things. As you know, A Limited is issuing the shares, correct, to B Limited. Why we are issuing the shares? Because we are getting control over the other enterprise or we are actually purchasing some stakes in B Limited, number one. After the issue, this line states that the other entity to whom we have issued the shares, they will have a total stakes of 55% in this particular entity. So if, actually it will never ever be given at your level, but just to make the point clear, suppose if it would have been given this way around, that after the issuance of the share, B Limited will have 55% stakes. In that case, it would become a case of reverse acquisition. In that case, it would have become a case of reverse acquisition. Why? Because after the issuance of the share, B Limited is commanding 55% stakes in A Limited. So sometime it could be a possibility. Sometime it may happen. Correct? Just to caution you and just to actually make you understand the meaning of this particular line. So in this case, no problem because B Limited is having only 5% stakes uh, in the in entity A after the issuance of these shares. Further, it is written some information is given with respect to contingent consideration and I will explain the meaning of contingent consideration also. Company A agrees to pay additional consideration of 7 lakh. If the cumulative profits of B Limited exceed 70 lakh over the next year, at the acquisition date it is not considered probable that extra consideration will be paid and it is also given the fair value of the contingent consideration is determined at rupees 3 lakh on the acquisition date. First of all, you let me know on the acquisition date, that means when we got control over this particular, sorry, when we got control over this particular entity, company A agrees to pay additional consideration. We have agreed to make some additional payment additional consideration. What is the amount of additional consideration? That is 7 lakh. Are there any condition attached to this, this payment? A Limited is telling to B Limited on the date of control that we are going to make you a payment, additional payment of 7 lakh. But some condition is also attached and the condition is that the if the cumulative profits of B Limited will exceed 70 lakh over the next two years, that means in the next two years, B Limited must give us a profit of 70 lakh. Correct? So we have put up a condition. Whenever additional payment would depend upon some condition, whenever additional payment would depend, additional payment would depend upon some conditions, such consideration is known as contingent consideration contingent consideration and this payment you are supposed to make only after two years. Now the point which you need to understand is that 
For a while, it seems actually this payment should not be included as a part of purchase consideration, but we will see that it will be included as a part of purchase consideration. I will tell you why. But first, you need to understand the concept quite well. Here, acquirer company is telling to the acquiry company on the date of acquisition that we will pay you further 7 lakh after 2 years, provided you are able to report a profit of what we call more than 70 lakh over a period of 2 years. Now, that means only after 2 years it will be known whether we are supposed to make this payment or not. Only after 2 years it will be known, isn't it or not? So, and moreover, in order to confuse you, it is also given in the question. In between, it is also given in the question that A Limited is of the opinion that target might not be achieved by this entity. Target might not be achieved by this particular entity. Target might not be achieved by this entity. This is also given in the question. See here. At the acquisition date, on the date of acquisition, at the acquisition date, it is not considered probable that extra consideration will be paid. The problem is this. So, because I want to explain contingent consideration also, just pay attention here. In this case, what is happening? On the date of acquisition, on the date of acquisition, you made a promise to the other entity that we will make you a payment of 7 lakh. But this payment will depend upon some condition but the condition would be met or not that will be known only after two years that will be known only after two years problem is this now on the date of on the date of acquisition it is also given in the question that fair value is three lakh on the date of acquisition fair value is three lakh this is fair value so logically the standard says irrespective of the fact irrespective of the fact whether this payment you are supposed to pay or not irrespective of that on the date of acquisition you are going to make it as a part of purchase consideration on the date of acquisition i am going to make it as a part of purchase consideration for example on the date of acquisition as you know when we prepare the opening consolidated balance sheet for that we need to pass some entries all the assets we take of the what we call acquiry company and all their liability. We pass the entry, assets taken over, liability taken over and then we also write the amount of consideration, whatever consideration is there. Then we, then standard says that because this amount you need to show it as a part of consideration. That means this amount will also be reflected as part of consideration. How it will be reflected as a part of consideration you will write here provision for contingent consideration provision for contingent consideration why we write provision for contingent consideration because it is it may be payable it may not be payable that means we have to make a provision for the same because we are not paying it today but it will have to be paid in case the conditions are what we call satisfied so it will have to be reflected number one and number two it must be reflected at fair value so on the date of acquisition you have to reflect it at rupees three lakh is it clear to you that mean contingent consideration is made part of purchase consideration but just to give you a little bit extra knowledge that means with respect to contingent consideration simultaneously i am explaining the, explaining the concept of contingent consideration pay attention it means whether this amount is payable or not that will be decided at a later date at a later date now i will, when i am going to reach the end of the first year what entry i am going to pass now at the end of the first year it could be a possibility that fair value because this amount we have noted down on the date of acquisition on the date of acquisition we have noted down the fair value as 3 lakh so we have created a provision to the tune of rupees 3 lakh now point is that when i will reach the end of the accounting year it is quite obviously it is quite obvious although it is not given in the question but just to make the point clear it is quite obvious that its value might what we call change let us say just presume for a while at the end of the first year fair value is now 5 lakh we, because with the passage of the time the value will increase no doubt about that that means when i will reach the end of the first year i will have to pass another entry what entry because now the fair value has gone up to 5 lakh so i will have to increase my this provision from 3 lakh to 5 lakh so I will have to increase it by 2 lakh. When I will increase the provision, my, it is a loss to us quite obviously because my liability is increasing. So 2 provision for contingent consideration, this is how you are going to pass the entry. 
is a clear to you at the end of the year at the first year end you are going to pass this entry for any change in fair value you will never ever be required to pass the entry because you are supposed to prepare consolidated balance sheet only in the beginning under india has ended in three so logically as per india has ended in three you need not require but sometime question concept based question could be asked correct so for that you need to understand this point also so at the end of the first year whatever changes will be there you are going to record them number one number two now we will reach the year end two we will reach the year end two when we will reach the year end two now two possibilities are there how it is a loss because earlier you recorded that you are supposed to make a payment of three lakh and you have recorded it at fair value you have recorded it at fair value now its fair value has gone up and if the fair value of your asset moves up it is a gain to you it's a fair value of provision provision is nothing but your liability so it's a loss to you correct now at the end of year two let us say fair value at the end of year two okay at the end of year two now there are two possibility there are two two possibility either i might have to pay and i might have to pay because the target is achieved now suppose entity b is able to achieve the target if target has been achieved then obviously you will have to make the payment isn't it or not i will have to make the payment now what payment i am going to make and we further presume that fair value at the end of year two has further gone up from five lakh to let us say seven lakh just to make the point clear from 5 lakh to 7 lakh at the end of the final year because at the end of the final year at the end of the final year now i will have to make a payment i will have to make it actually i told you okay leave it because generally at the end of year two you will not be given the fair value you will simply be given in the question because there is no use of fair value now that is the reason i am telling at the end of year two question will simply tell you in case a concept based question would strike in the examination it will simply tell you that target has been achieved or not achieved and accordingly you will have to pass the entry now suppose target has been achieved suppose target has been achieved you had promised earlier that we are going to make you an additional payment of 7 lakh correct so obviously if the target would be achieved at the end of the second year you will be writing here two banks 7 lakh because you have you had made a promise you will have to carry out and fulfill your promise isn't it or not but problem is that you have already created a provision and till the end of the second year the total amount in your provision how much is the how much is your provision amount now kindly let me know what is the balance in provision at the end of the second year see in the first year in the beginning you had a balance of rupees 3 lakh in the beginning of the year then at the end of the year you increased it by 2 lakh correct so that means at the end of the first year balance in your provision was 5 lakh and because no fair value change now is given at the end of the second year so there is a balance of only 5 lakh so provision for contingent consideration because there is a balance of 5 lakh so i'm making a payment of 7 lakh but there is a balance of only 5 lakh so this provision will not require because now i am paying off this amount so this liability will move out or it, this liability will get extinguished so provision for contingent consideration account debit to bank so that now you are going to write here profit and loss account debit to lakh because we made a payment of rupees 7 lakh and balance in our provision is 5 lakh so there will be a loss because of what we call higher payment is it clear to you at the end of the first year dear beta uh, mano uh, I'm speaking Hindi because I'm taking Hindi sessions for CA Inter. But CA Inter ke classes definitely start karenge. Aaj kal aap dekh ho ki main bahut zyada busy chal raha hoon. To definitely kal se aapki classes bhi start ho di shuru ho jayenge. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. You can take my words for it. Tomorrow you will have the what we call lecture. So just pay attention here. So in this particular case, target is achieved. If target is achieved, how we are going to treat it? I hope now as an accountant, you need to understand that. Now suppose if target would not have been achieved, if target is not achieved, then how you would have dealt with the provision? 
you created a provision under the impression now presently the balance in your provision is 5 lakh but why we create this provision or why we create provision in account because we are under an impression that we might have to pay something isn't it or not that is why we create provision now problem is that when i have when i am going to create the provision in accounts my profit or loss account definitely will be debited whatever provisions gets created in accounts those get created out of profit or loss account itself isn't it so point which you need to understand is that now because whatever provision which you created and which you must have had created out of your profit or loss account there is a balance in it 5 lakh and now you need not require to pay this amount so that means you will take it again back to your profit and loss account. This entry you are supposed to pass. So this is how the entire treatment of because generally the book will be silent. Book will simply tell you only this much that contingent consideration should be presented as a part of purchase consideration at fair value. That's all. But I've given you the complete comprehensive treatment that will hold you in a very good state later on when you will become what we call a, C, a high class, high quality CMA. Correct. So I wish that each one of you definitely and must become. Why not? Because let me tell you, many among you are under phobia. Many people unnecessarily put up videos that CMA is endangered or something like that. I do not know why the hell in the world such people actually do such sort of truants. Correct. Generally, I avoid myself from what we call using such words, but unfortunately, I have to. Actually, you must understand in practical life nowadays, you need not require to bother at all whether you are a CA or whether you are a CMA. Only thing is that your knowledge will be tested. How well you are able to deliver the answer to the questions of the interviewer? And they are going to ask questions such questions like this one. Correct? They want to know actually. Correct? So that is the point which you need to understand all these things. So. Are you she told that she never understood this particular treatment? I hope right now you have understood it. Correct. So thank you very much if you have understood it. Anyway, we were talking about this particular question, but in between I have covered another concept of contingent consideration. I will take another question with respect to that also. Don't worry about that. So in this particular question, which is related to business combination, in this particular question, we were talking about the purchase consideration. So point here is that obviously when I'm going to compute the total amount of purchase consideration, I will write here fair value of contingent consideration because on the date of acquisition, we have to treat it as a part of purchase consideration. Correct. And generally it, for that, we have to create a provision anyway. So fair value is three lakh. It will also be considered as a part of purchase consideration. Now it is given in the question, another concept, transaction cost, company A pays acquisition related cost of rupees 1 lakh. See, when we acquire the other entity, correct, sometime the acquirer entity had to make various sort of expenses. For example, first of all, we have to create a team and we will ask the team to create and select the companies, correct, which are giving competition to us and or whether such companies which are interested in what we call getting acquired by us. So finders fees, legal fee or etc. Such acquisition cost that is known as acquisition cost. Acquisition cost is always is always considered as of revenue nature and it will be debited to profit and loss account. Correct. When at the end of the year, so no treatment on the date of acquisition, transaction cost will be debited to profit and loss account. Is it clear to you? So no treatment. Further in this particular question, it is stated regarding non-controlling interest. Regarding non-controlling interest, it is given fair value of NCI is 7,50,000. Fair value of NCI is determined at 7,50,000. So for that, so you must be thankful to the examiner. He has already given you given you the fair value of the NCI. It means you should not do the folly or you should not commit a mistake here in unnecessarily computing NCI as per proportionate share net assets basis. So fair value of NCI is given. Now here, the most important point is this one previously held non-controlling interest because previously held a non-controlling interest in the sense because earlier your own interest was only 25%. So even you were NC NCI earlier because you were not having the control. Correct. So indirectly, it means the question here is talking about previously held investment. 
company a has owned 25 percent of the share in company b for several years now question has clarified that these shares uh, uh, are held by entity a for several years that been way back we might have invested this amount on 1 11 2024 investment included in companies a's consolidated statement of financial position at rupees 6 lakh what does it mean and further it is written and accounted for using the equity method at a fair value of rupees 20 lakh important thing is that important thing is that what is the fair value on the date of acquisition we are concerned with that so now it is given in the question that on the date of acquisition your previously held investment your previously held investment is having a fair value of rupees 20 lakh fair value of rupees 20 lakh this is the important point which you need to take care of now suppose if i am going to ask you and question has clarified one important point that company has recorded these investment at a valuation of rupees 6 lakh that mean earlier when we made the investment we must have in made the investment for rupees 6 lakh this was the value of our previously held investment now its fair value has gone up to 20 lakh could anyone among you tell me what will be my entry although entry is not needed in this particular question but just to test you what will be the entry for previously held investment on the date of acquisition of course debit item investment in b limited now you tell me the other part of the entry investment in b limited investment in b limited what should i write here of course the value of investment has gone up by 14 lakh i think yeah 6 to 20 lakh gone up by 14 lakh yes give me the answer you take time no problem at all in between i will take the rest what should i write investment in b limited account debit 2 first answer satya priya profit or loss account credit vinay kumar fvtpl ajit chen profit or loss account upendra rajvan fvtpl okay fine don't write fvtpl simply write profit and loss account but i got each one of you are absolutely fine correct answer because i just told if nothing is mentioned always presume that our previously held investment are being measured through through uh, fair value through profit and loss account so that is why we will take the profit this time to profit and loss account is it clear to you or not okay so if this point is clear to each and every one now we can move over to the other part now point is that this particular point is related to investment so it will not have any effect as far as what we call this thing is concerned so our total purchase consider consideration till up to this particular point is this much correct till up to this particular point is this much now what else is given in the question the fair value mm -hmm. the fair value of companies b's net identifiable asset is rupees 60 lakh fair value why you need fair value of net identifiable assets of b limited on the date of acquisition that mean total nifa or net identifiable assets of b limited is equal to 60 lakh is it clear to you now in this case if i am going to ask you that could you help me in computing the goodwill of this particular concern now first of all if i am going to add all this thing my total purchase consideration will be how much 69 plus 3 is equal to 72 so 72 lakh is your total consideration total amount of consideration is it clear now you kindly let me know in this particular question how i am going to compute the amount of goodwill pay attention here pay attention here first of all obviously i have computed i have already computed 72 lakh as purchase consideration now in order to compute the goodwill first of all as i told you correct thank you rahul jaju uh, just pay attention here nifa on the date of acquisition is equal to 60 lakh obviously i will have to note down the net identifiable assets of my acquiry company on the date of acquisition 60 lakh then out of that i will have to pluck out the share of nci 
but keep an eye here nci is being measured on being measured on proportionate share of net assets basis no on fair value basis and value is given to you 750 so i will pluck out the nci share so remaining share definitely belongs to acquirer but out of these net assets how many worth of assets out of 52 lakh 50 thousand are moving to us because of additional sorry because of previously held investment all you need to do is take into account your previously held investment and just have a look over the fair value so previously held investment on the date of acquisition their fair value is 20 lakh it suggests that out of 52 lakh 50 thousand 20 lakh worth of net assets are accruing towards the parent because of previously held investment is it clear to you so now we can say acquirer share on account of additional investment is 32 lakh 50 thousand and this amount you will have to compare with the amount of consideration additional consideration and additional consideration in this case you have already computed 72 lakh because this entire payment is related to what 65 percent stakes which you uh, made additional investment correct so by comparing these two items now you are in a position to find out the amount of goodwill i hope now it is absolutely clear how you are going to compute the amount of goodwill on the date of acquisition especially if the case happens to be case of business combination is it clear to you if you have done this particular case now i will take up this question december 24 and similar sort of question is struck in 24 also let me tell you same question hardly two three figures are changed now kindly do this question without having a look over here without having a look over here and it's please don't try to cheat me if somebody would try to cheat then definitely that means you are cheating yourself and your own success so try to do it honestly without having a look over the solution i will give you 10 minutes of time and in between i will take five minutes of rest i will continue as usual correct so just five minutes and try to go through this question and you should be in a position to do this question but without having a look over the solution i have already told you correct so be careful
So welcome again. How many among you gave try to this particular question? Just let me know after it and you got the answer. Correct. Now in this question, what is happening? K limited is having 30% stakes in L limited. The investment in L limited is accounted for as an investment in associate as per AS 28. Obviously my earlier in just wait in between my mobile also got up. Sorry, extremely. K Limited holds 30% stakes in L Limited. This investment in L Limited is accounted for as investment in associate as per 28. Quite obviously, earlier your investment is 30%. So other entity will be treated as your associate entity, as an associate entity. So carrying amount of investment is 140 lakh. That means earlier 30% worth of investment which you made, uh, you made an investment for 140 lakh it means. Now K Limited purchases the remaining 70% stakes in L Limited for a consideration of 980 lakh. That means on the date of acquisition, you have acquired 100% stakes now, 30% earlier, 70% now. So on the date of acquisition, there is no NCI in this particular case. The fair value of previously held investment is measured at 420 lakhs on the date of acquisition, correct? and 70% additional stakes. The value of L Limited's identifiable net assets on the date is 1120. So first of all, as usual, you are going to take into account 1120 total net assets, pluck out the share of NCI, there is no NCI. So all the net assets belong to parent, but out of this, how many net assets belong to us because of our earlier investment? For that, we need to know what is the fair value on the date of acquisition that happens to be your 420 that is clearly given in the question. So subtract this 420. Now whatever is re remaining, it shows that this is the share. This is the share of the entity on account of additional investment. Is it clear to you? Now you compare this amount with the consideration, additional consideration. You will get the difference because consideration is more. The difference will be treated as goodwill. Now I will take you another question. Same question 25.5 which we did earlier. Correct. Now just have a look over this particular data once again. Once again, kindly look over this particular data. I'm trying to tell you how many questions because how many questions related to business combination achieved in stages have been asked in the examination. Correct. Just pay attention once again towards this particular data. Same question which we did in the last session. But why I'm trying to why I'm asking you to pay attention to this particular question once again. Just pay. I will let you know. This is the balance sheet of S Limited as we saw in the last session also. Their carrying amount is given, correct? Last In the last session we have already talked about this and there some fair value is also given. Their fair value is also given. In the last session I talked about this particular fact that whatever carrying amount of contingent liability is given, you presume that this is zero, correct? Because this amount is never ever written in the balance sheet. So. This is the fair value of what we call contingent liability. Now in this question, parents equity share capital is 12,000 figures are in crores and other equity is 4,000. Then we have borrowings, then we have trade payable, we have a property plant and equipment, we have investment property. I told you investment property in day 40 applies. A property is considered as in day uh, sorry, uh, investment property when you hold the property for the purpose of capital appreciation or for sale, what we call in the near future or for letting it out. That is known as investment property. Now I would love you to pay attention towards this particular item investments. Correct? This particular item. P Limited has made some investment. Where these investments have been made, it is not given very clearly in the question. So they might have made this investment anywhere else and their current assets are also given. Now, below, as we saw even in the last session that the market price, market price of the respective, mm -hmm, market price of respective company shares are 16 and 15. That means market price of P Limited is actually 16 and market price of S Limited, which is acquiry entity, P Limited is acquirer entity, 16 and 15 respectively. Now you now you move over to case B. Here is the case B. Even in the last, last session, I told you when this question is struck in the examination, it carried along with it three cases. The first case we did last time 
Now I am doing the second case. See here. Here it is written P Limited acquires 45% stakes on 31st of 3, 2023. The balance sheet of the bal balance sheet date which is given is also 31st 12, 2023. That means in this particular question what is happening? The balance sheet of the respective companies are given to us on 31st of 3, 2023. Correct the balance sheet which you went through earlier just a moment ago. So balance sheet date is 31st 3, 2023 and further it is given that on this date you acquired 45% stakes. So logically when I am acquiring 45% stakes I am not having the control I need not require to talk about it. Then further it is given purchase sometime no this pen creates a bit of problem. And purchase consideration is settled by issue of 450 crore share for which no accounting effect has been given. So it is clearly given in the question that purchasing company when it acquired 45% stakes, it made a payment of 450 crore by issue of 450 crore equity share. 450 crore shares were issued and as we know that value per share of P limited is 16. So quite obviously I am going to make the payment at this value 450 crore share I am going to issue but I will issue them at the rate of 16. I need not require to again tell this. It is given investment in the balance sheet of P limited. Now come over to this particular point. That is why I stressed your attraction in fact your attention towards this particular point. In the balance sheet, in the column of P limited, it is written 3,500. Now question says that this 3,500 is nothing but the amount paid by P limited for their earlier investment in this particular entity in S limited. That means in S limited, P limited earlier might have made some investment to the extent of 30%. Now question says below. Question says below investment in the balance sheet of P limited investment in the balance sheet of P limited that is 3500 shows previously held 30% interest in S limited shows previously held investment in P limited that mean earlier you might have made some investment in P limited to the extent of 30% number one and number two you must have purchased 30% stakes by making a payment of 3500 crores because against investment the amount written is 3500. I hope this point is clear now. Is it clear to you? That means now on the balance sheet date at the end of the year in the current year when we acquired further 45% stakes now control is moving to us. So this date will be considered as date of acquisition. This date will be considered as date of acquisition number one. This will be our date of acquisition. On this particular date, now we are in total having 75% stake, 30% plus 45%. So 25% shares, it means are held by, are held by NCI, are held by NCI. But in this question, this is a little bit tougher than the earlier one. In this question, it is also written, non-controlling interest is measured at fair value. Now in this question it is clearly stated that non-controlling interest which is 25% is measured at fair value. It is to be measured at fair value that it means now you cannot use PSNA method. You cannot use PSNA method. Could anyone among could anyone among you tell me how I am going to compute fair value that I will ask you in a moment but first have a look over here. Obviously, you will have you need to understand all these things degree of control that mean in the uh, other entity that is uh, investee entity S limited we are having a control of 75% because of our 30% earlier investment and 45% additional investment our total investment is 75% and NCI is 25%. Now date of control is at the end of the year. You need not require to pay attention towards this particular point at this moment. It will be needed when we will do accounting under India's 110. Now you need to compute the amount of purchase consideration. As I told you, it is clearly given in the question you how many shares your entity is issuing to the other entity 450 crore share and market value of your share is 16. So that means purchase consideration must be equal to 7200. Is it clear to you? Last time I also told you 
that you can compute the fair value gain also. Now your fair value gain if you are going to compute as we computed even in the last session same thing will be there and your total fair value gain will be equal to 2000. Is it clear to you? So now on the date of acquisition because in this question it is not given what is the fair value of net assets on the date of acquisition which we can determine as we know. So equity or net assets on the date of acquisition. In order to determine the what we call net assets on the date of acquisition, we generally adopt equity method. Under equity method, we take into account share capital of what we call S limited on the date of acquisition 8000. Their other equity is 6000. It is clearly given in the question. Now fair value changes you must not forget to write because fair value changes ultimately will move to other comprehensive income or other equity. You can simply say they are also part of other equity. So now we can safely say that on the date of acquisition net assets of S limited that is acquiry entity or investee entity must be equal to 16,000. Now out of these net assets just pay attention out of these net assets of 16,000. First of all, I will have to pluck out the share of NCI. If I will have to pluck out the share of NCI, could anyone among you tell me what will be the value of NCI? Somebody has already given an answer. Uh, Dipti Thakur, ha I think, has given the answer. Let me check it out. And your answer seems to be correct. NCI share is 25%, no doubt. But problem is that we have to apply the fair value approach. In order to understand the computation of NCI, First of all, you need to understand at this moment on the date of acquisition, you are acquiring only 45% share. On the date of acquisition, you are acquiring on additional investment. On this date, you are getting 45% share. And for 45% share, how much amount you are paying? You are paying 7,200, 450 shares at the rate of 16. So that means the fair value of 45% is 7,200. So what will be the fair value of 25% because NCI is 25%. So that is how you will compute the fair value 25 into 7200 divided by 45. So I think Dipti has already told me it is 4000. I presume that it is coming to 4000 and thank you very much. So you have made my task a little bit easier. So I will consider it as 4000. Is it clear to you? I hope the calculation is correct. So 4000 out of 16,000 belong to NCI. What about the remaining asset? Remaining asset, it belongs to acquirer that is P limited. So acquirer share of net assets will be equal to 16,000. But problem is this. This is a case of step acquisition or business combination achieved in stages. In this case, we simply cannot what we call compare this amount with the amount of consideration. So first of all, I need to find out previously held investment previously held investment is 30 percent so what is the fair value on the date of acquisition of your previously held investment because in this question unlike the previous three question which we did on business combination because in the earlier three question which we did it was clearly written that on the date of acquisition the fair value of your previously held investment was so and so so this time it is not given but you have to find it out so how you are going to find out the fair value of your previously held investment as simple as that you will apply the same formula for 45 percent fair value is 7200 so what will be the fair value for 25 percent sorry 30 percent extremely sorry this is 30 percent so what will be the value of 30 percent so this is how you are going to determine the fair value on the date of acquisition is it clear to you now, what will be the amount 30 into 7200 divided by 4500? Could anyone kindly tell me so that I'm escaped of computing it? I think it is equal to 4800. So 4800, even I'm wrong, leave it. Try to understand the concept. This is the fair value of your previously held investment. Indirectly, fair value of previously held investment on the date now it has been substantiated by satya 4800 thank you so much now if you have if the fair value of your previously held investment on the date of acquisition is 4800 it means out of 16000 worth of net assets which are flowing to what we call parent entity or acquirer entity 
out of those 16,000, 4,800 is because of your earlier investment. So, because of your additional investment, because of your additional investment, you are getting only this much share. If I am going to subtract 4,800 from 16,000, I will get 7,200. So this is the share of net assets which the acquirer entity is getting on account of additional investment. Correct. This is the share on account of additional investment. Now how much purchase consideration you are paying for only additional, only additional amount you need to take. For 45% you are paying 7200 because it is given that you acquire 45% further share and you made a payment of 460 share at the rate of 16, 7200. In this case there is no goodwill because consideration and share of net asset is same. So although there is no need to do all these workings to be very honest with you. Directly through entry you can determine the amount of goodwill also. Because in this question, we are supposed to pass the entry. So first of all, I am the investor entity. I am taking over the business of what we call S Limited. So whatever assets I am taking over, I will note them down at fair value. So I must record the current asset of S Limited at fair value. I am taking over the investment of what we call other entity at fair value, investment property at fair value, property plant and equipment at fair value. I told even in the last session, if fair value is given fine, if fair value is not given, whatever value given in the balance sheet, you consider it as the fair value. Then I will write here two borrowings, we are taking over the borrowings, two trade payables, then we are taking over contingent liability also, don't forget this. And now. I will write here two consideration payable 7200 then I will write to NCI 4000 and in the entry in the entry you must not forget to write previously held investment if you had your earlier previously held investment you must also put it towards the credit side correct indirectly we call it cancellation of our old investment because earlier that entity was our associate entity so we have to cancel our uh, old investment in that particular entity and now we are having 75 percent total investment another entity has become our acquirer entity so in case of business combination achieved in stages how we have to compute goodwill i have already told you if you want to compute goodwill directly through entry in that case you need to understand that whatever assets you are taking whatever liability you are taking Besides that, you must not forget to write, of course, consideration payable in NCI. You must not forget to write previously held investment. So previously held investment, why we write it? Because we have to cancel our previously held investment. Why we need to cancel? Because now the status has changed. Why the status has changed? Because earlier other entity was your associate. Now it has become your, what we call, uh, your acquiring entity, your subsidiary entity. Is it clear to you? So by balancing these two you can directly get the amount of goodwill this is how you are supposed to do this particular question is it clear to you or not correct so you must have noticed four question straight away of business comment now the third question third part of this particular question you can attempt off your own you can easily i i know that you can do it very easily it is given in a solved manner you can do this particular question off your own now we come to the next part of today's session next part of today's session what i am going to discuss some of you might be wondering sir would you be able to finish up all the topics today you need not require to worry about that we have already taken business combination achieved in stages now i have already taken this particular concept contingent consideration somewhere i have a feeling somewhere i have a feeling that in the current year you will have some concept based question either from contingent consideration or from deferred consideration although this concept now you are well aware of still i am going through this particular case study this case study is given in your page number mm -hmm, 1.16 1.16 or 1.15 correct 116 or 1.15 In this particular case study, it is given E1 limited, acquired B limited, 4 rupees 100 lakh. That means purchase consideration is agreed at rupees 100 lakh and purchase consideration is being paid in cash. And also E1 limited shall pay 20 lakhs after 2 years if profits of B limited for the second year would exceed 2 crores. 
similar to the question which we did earlier correct so in this case it is a case of contingent consideration why because payment will be made later on number one and payment is based upon achievement of some targets the target is that b limited must what we call get a profit of rupees two crores this payment will be made after two years now the fair value of contingent consideration on the date of acquisition is 13 lakh and on the date of acquisition is 13 lakh and fair value of contingent consideration at the end of the first year is 16 lakh it is also given in this time in the question now as per the agreement you must not lose sight of this particular fact that you are saying to the what we call other entity we will pay you additional amount of 20 lakh their fair value in the beginning is 13 and at the end of the first year it is equal to 16 lakh now initially when you are going to record as i told you initially we generally record all the asset as we just did earlier all the liability besides that the amount of consideration you can write instead of cash you can write consideration 100 lakh and then we will have to write provision for contingent consideration absolute amount of absolute amount of contingent consideration is 20 lakh but on the date of acquisition its fair value is 30 lakh so i will record in this manner asset account debit liability account debit to what we call consideration and two provision for contingent consideration is it clear to you now when i will reach the end of the first year as you know the fair value has now gone up from 13 lakh to 16 lakh because the fair value of the liability has gone up so you will have to make additional provision so that is a sort of loss to you that is why you are going to write fair value changes to provision for contingent consideration account so 3 lakh 3 lakh so this is the entry you are going to write because now there is a loss to you now at the end of second year i told you earlier two possibilities may unfold either your target is achieved or your target is not achieved now supposing our target has been achieved then i will have to make a payment absolute payment of 20 lakh but in the provision what is the balance in the provision balance is 16 lakh why 16 lakh balance because in the beginning we recognize the provision at 13 lakh number one and then we increased it by 3 lakhs so total balance in provision is 16 but i'm making a payment of 20 lakhs so 4 lakh will be debited to profit and loss account this is exactly what i cleared earlier now suppose if the target is not achieved if the target is not achieved you are refrained from making the payment now it is a sort of gain because whatever provision you must have created earlier through your profit and loss account so now you will take it back as we call it in accounting language we, we will revert it back to profit and loss account is it clear to you this is concept of contingent consideration now we come across contingent liability i have already explained this concept earlier i have already told you when we are acquiring other entity if other entity is having a contingent liability because contingent liability is generally not recorded in the balance sheet it when we are not recording it in the balance sheet that means we are not treating it as a liability what is a contingent liability a contingent liability means there is an obligation when we say obligation that means there is some foundation and you must have heard this word present obligation what is present obligation present obligation means obligation on the reporting date obligation on the reporting date when i am reporting that is generally at the end of the accounting year when i will report that means i will have to prepare my financial statement so i will see to it whether there is any present obligation or not if there is some present obligation because of anything let us say a case is going on or because other party might have put up a case against us because of any other reason if suppose we are having a present obligation but if we are of the opinion that outflow of funds will not be there will not be there that mean probability of outflow of funds is negligible so in that particular case we will not recognize it as liability correct this is the general rule this is a general rule i am talking about so such liability such present obligation where probability of outflow of funds are is less insignificant or slim in such cases such transactions are recorded as contingent liability by way of footnotes but at the same time a probability of outflow of funds is higher correct as you have heard the phrase more likely than not that means a probability of outflow of funds is greater in that case we will create a provision that means we will recognize it as a liability these are the general rules but standard india 103 says that irrespective of probability of outflow of funds 
if other party that mean acquiry entity is having a contingent liability you will record it as a liability as we have already seen so this is one question it asks with this and you can easily answer this question and only other thing is that such liability must be recorded at fair value this is the point you need to understand then there is another concept determination of business i told you and in my regular classes we have really covered we have covered near about 10 case studies something like this generally i don't expect you are going to get a question out of this particular uh, this particular section to be very honest with you but just to make point clear i told you earlier when we acquire the business of the other entity other entity must meet the definition of the business and if you remember i talked about what is business that is input plus processes must be equal to output what is input input means resources assets what is processes techniques so by integrating these two we should be in a position to what we call uh, create some output that mean we should be in a position to generate some output just to give you an idea regarding that there is an entity by the name of sy limited and it got 100% stakes for 80 million in gx limited so gx limited is our acquiry entity and we are acquirer we are investor entity Now question says that GX Limited has a workforce they have a factory warehouse plant raw material etc Now question is asking you is GX Limited is a business quite obviously it is a case of business why it is a business so you can cite the answer because other entity is operating with various assets correct there is a group of assets and activities that can be integrated to create the output so that is why other entity will be treated as a business is it clear now this is there is another concept that is deferred consideration i have already told you surely and surely either through contingent consideration and there are more chances of contingent consideration or through deferred consideration you may get a question in the examination correct this is my personal hunch now what is deferred consideration it is similar to contingent consideration it is similar to contingent consideration with the only difference is that here we are telling to the acquiry entity on the date of acquisition on the date of acquisition we are telling to the acquiry company that we will pay you some amount but at a later stage after one year two year three years but no conditions are attached in this case so point is this so deferred consideration must be made a part of purchase consideration at fair value we write generally fair value but what will be the fair value the fair value in order to compute the fair value you will have to compute the present value or you will have to compute the present value just to make the point clear let us say there is an entity by the name of e1 there is an entity by the name of e1 mm -hmm. now e1 acquires e2 in the beginning of the current year and it is agreed between the party that we will pay you a purchase consideration of 100 lakhs in cash and also to pay 20 lakhs after 20 after 2 years so 100 lakh will be the payment which will be made on the date of acquisition and further there is an agreement that we will pay you 20 lakhs but after 2 years but at the on the date of acquisition i will have to pass the entry assets account debit liability account debit of obviously to cash purchase consideration and i will have to write provision for deferred consideration we write provision because this amount has to be paid at a later stage so presently i will have to create a provision but what will be the amount of provision how i made a provision of 1652800 so pay attention here you have decided that you are going to pay 20 lakh after 2 years so you will and here in the question it is also generally under such question either you will be given discount rate or directly you will be given fair value after 2 years correct so in this question they have given discount rate is 10% and present value factor at 10% for second year is 8.264 so you can simply multiply it what we call 8.264 with rupees 20 lakh to determine the present value that will be equal to 16 lakh 52800 so at this value you are going to what we call recognize provision for uh, deferred consideration is it clear to you and we have already covered this particular concept that is acquisition related cost acquisition related cost i told you correct whatever cost which has been incurred by acquirer entity correct the such cost may include finder's fee advisory legal accounting valuation professional consultant fee general administrative expense etc such things are always expensed correct 
they are expensed at the end of the accounting year. They are treated as a sort of revenue expenditure. They are never ever capitalized. Is it clear to you or not? So after having done this particular topic, after having done this particular topic, now we shall move over to the other part of the game. Now next topic, next topics, kindly note them very carefully. For example, concept number five, this is related to books of acquiry. This topic we will do when I will take revisionary session for amalgamation. Are you getting my point or not? Those among you who have already done full course from us, they know very well that this particular topic basically deals with amalgamation. Correct? Similarly, similarly concepts, uh, concept number six, intercompany holding. This topic also will be taken along with amalgamation. Then, 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 then we have in this case, reverse acquisition we will take and we will start today with reverse acquisition only but first of all let me tell you which are the topics which we will take along with amalgamation so that there is no uh, confusion regarding that question number two this question you should be in a position to do it by yourself because this is related to what we call business combination achieved in stages and now you have become deft in it you should be in a position to do this particular question Second important point, right, this question immediately after that one. The question which I have marked with this blue mark, correct? All these questions will be taken along with amalgamation. Very next chapter, in fact, our next chapter will be amalgamation. So in the amalgamation, we will cover up this particular question because these are related to amalgamation actually. And similarly, this particular question also. So that being now the remaining topic which we are supposed to cover here under this particular chapter, one is reverse acquisition, another one is common control and another question which I have given under what we call uh, important question, first question. So these are the things which we are supposed to do. Now, first of all, we will start today's session with reverse acquisition, reverse acquisition. I have already told you that so far in the examination, especially with respect to new syllabus, we haven't seen any question tossing up from what we call reverse acquisition. And that is the reason, that is the reason actually why this particular topic you need to focus upon. Because those topics which have remained untouched, there is every chance that they may strike in the examination. Is it clear to you or not? So we start with <coughs> concept number seven, reverse acquisition. I hope I am audible to everyone. And it would be better if some of you would clarify this so that there is no hunch in me. I hope I am audible to everyone. And another uh, piece of uh, news is that actually we are going to upload the test on our website, correct? The website is sanjaywelkinsofficial.com, sanjaywelkinsofficial.com over there. Uh, and we will also put up all the steps so that you can locate the test paper or we will put up the test paper in the app and you will get the what we call solutions also there along with that. So now reverse acquisition we are starting. Initially, when I told you that where a particular entity acquires the other entity, for example, entity A is acquiring entity B, entity B Quite obviously, entity A will be considered as legal acquirer and this entity is considered as legal acquiry from the legal perspective because we are acquiring this particular company, let us say, by taking over 75% of stakes. But in spite of that, there could be a possibility, even though we are getting 75% stakes in B, but sometime on rare occasion, it could be a possibility. It could be a possibility that B, the control is actually getting landed up in the hands of entity entity B. So if such a situation would arise in that particular case, because here company A is investing in the other entity. So from the legal perspective, actually company A is the legal acquirer, but controls because of some or other reason is lying in the hands of let us say company B. So for the accounting purpose, this legal acquiry will become the accounting acquirer. So when legal acquiry becomes the legal ac accounting acquirer, that becomes a case of reverse acquisition. Now under reverse acquisition, what we are supposed to do, kindly pay attention to this particular concept, correct? We take up 7.1. Now just have a look over this particular question. And this particular question we have also covered in our regular classes. Balance sheet of HNS Limited as a 31st of 3, 2022 is given to you. Now here, 
non current assets you just have a look over here there are two companies one is h limited and another one is s limited correct and in the balance sheet of s limited we find non current asset to the tune of 2000 while in the balance sheet of s limited as you can see non current asset are to the tune of rupees 3000 besides that current assets we are given and this is the total we are given this is the total total of the asset side now coming over to the what we call liability side equity share capital total amount is 1000 and one share is of rupees 10 each so that mean number of share is 100 similarly their share capital is 800 and one share is of rupees 10 each that mean number of share is 80 then we have other equity 500 1600 non current liability and then we have current liability so this is small information is given to you now just have a look over here in this question it is given h limited and s limited shares are quoted at rupees 20 and 50 respectively in the market shares of h limited and s limited are quoted in the market at rupees 20 and at rupees 50 that mean in the market actually the price of h limited is 20 while price of s limited happens to be 50 this is the information which is submitted to you so far Further, in this particular question, it is written H limited issues shares in exchange ratio based on quoted price. So H limited, H limited is issuing shares to S limited. And as per the direction of the question, shares are being issued on the basis of exchange ratio and exchange ratio will be based upon the quoted price. Is it clear to you? <clears throat> I will tell you, don't worry about that. How will you recognize it as a case of reverse acquisition? Because so far, we have simply gone through the question and we haven't come across any hint that it is a case of reverse acquisition. So you will simply move on. Now just have a look and I will give you every nitty and gritty of this particular question. Just have a look over here. For instance, after having gone through this particular question, at least you can understand one thing that H limited is acquiring S limited. How did you conclude this? How did you conclude this? that H limited is acquiring S limited. How did you con conclude this? Or how will you conclude it? Anyone? I have written H limited is acquiring S limited. So how we have come across this conclusion? Just kindly tell me. After having gone through this particular information, now we are concluding that H limited is acquiring S limited, but how we have concluded it? Because in the question, it is given that H limited is issuing shares. That means H limited is issuing the shares, not a case of control, but we are issuing shares. Generally, the company which is issuing issuing the shares, that means this company is investing in the other entity. Right, Vinay Kumar, absolutely. So that is the reason actually, in this case, the first conclusion will be H limited is acquiring S limited. Is it clear to you? Because in the question it is given H limited is issuing shares to the other entity. Nice answers. <clears throat> Mahima Singh, not more than 50%. Where? In the question so far it is not written anywhere that we are getting more than 50% share. In this question it is not written. It is written here H limited issues share in exchange ratio. That means H limited is issuing share to the other entity. And I just told because you are the investor entity. Correct. You are investing in other entities. So that is why it will be concluded that at this moment it, it will be concluded that you are the what we call acquirer entity. Is it clear to you? So that is why so far our conclusion is like this. Now just kindly pay attention. So, so far as per your versions and my version, H limited seems to be the what we call legal acquirer. So that is why I have written here legal acquirer from the legal perspective, H limited happens to be the legal acquirer, while S limited happens to be the legal acquiry company. Is it clear to you? Is it clear to you? And how we concluded it, I have also written here, given in the question that H limited is issuing shares to S limited. Because of this, now we are concluding that H limited is the legal acquirer. Now, because we are under an impression till up to this particular movement that this is a normal question because H limited is acquirer entity and S limited is acquiry entity. So far we are under this particular impression and everyone is under this particular impression. Correct? Now pay attention. <clears throat> because we are issuing the share, we means the H limited is issuing the share. Somewhere you do this particular working, somewhere means you first of all you need to do the working like this first of all note down the share capital of s limited and s limited as it is given in the question that face value of one share is 10 
So just to make you understand thoroughly, I have done this working, although it is not needed at all. That means total number of shares of H limited is 100 and of S limited is 80, isn't it? Now, just have a look over here. Now we come over to the exchange ratio. Why we need exchange ratio? Because it is given in the question that H limited is will issue the shares to S limited on the basis of exchange ratio. Now, how to compute the exchange ratio? Further, it is given in the question that ratio will be based upon the market prices. Now in the question, it is given that market price of S limited happens to be 20, while the market price of S limited happens to be 50. This is given in the question. Is it clear to you? Now, it is given in the question that market price of H limited is 20. And market price of S limited happens to be 50. So, I will shorten it a wee bit. So, ratio will become 2 is to 5. I think till up to this particular point, things are clear. Correct? Ratio is 2 is to 5. Now, what I am doing, just pay attention. What does this ratio mean? What is the implication of this ratio? So in order to understand and interpret the implication of this particular ratio, what you do, you shift 2 to the other side and shift 5 to the other side, as I have marked here. Now after shifting this, 5 will move here and 2 will move to this side. So this will help you in understanding the replication of this ratio 2 is to 5. Actually, the ratio is 2 is to 5 without any doubt. But in order to understand the replication of this particular ratio, I am doing it this way around. I have shifted now this, these figures. After interchanging the places of the figures, now I will come to know that actually in this particular case, market price of H limited is far lesser than what we call S limited. Far lesser than S limited. Correct? Now, it means H limited will issue five shares for every two shares of S limited. So now it becomes easier for us to understand the implication of this ratio. Is it clear to you? Now we have come to the conclusion that H limited will issue five shares for every two shares of S limited. And I will prove it also why. See here. Quoted price of S limited is 50. So that means the total value of two shares of S limited as per the market value is 100. Total value of two shares of S limited will be equal to 100. And total value of five shares of H limited is equal to, because market price of S limited is 20, that will be equal to 100. Suppose if I want to satisfy 100 worth, it means I will have to issue five shares against two shares of S limited. I hope you got this particular point. So exchange ratio is two is to five, but through exchange ratio, you should be in a position to know how many shares will have to be issued by, issued by H limited for number of shares of S limited. That means for every two shares of S limited, H limited will have to issue five shares. Is it clear to everyone? Is it clear to everyone till up to this particular point? Is it clear to everyone till up to this particular time, at this particular point of time? Presuming it is clear. Now, whatever I have done here roughly, actually I have presented here, see here. So once you have understood the uh, this particular, what we call uh, directions of the arrow, so it means now we have come to the conclusion that H limited will issue five shares for every two shares. So, and I have also written for your sake that it means H limited will issue five shares for every two shares. And just to make you understand better, I have also written value of five shares of H limited will be equal to 100 and value of two shares of S limited will also be equal to 100. So the basic purpose of computing exchange ratio here is because in this particular question it is given H limited is issuing the shares and on the basis of exchange ratio. So I want to know actually how many shares H limited will issue to S limited. So coming over to the next point, here it is written number of share to be issued by H limited to S limited. How we are going to compute how many number of share will be issued by H limited to S limited. For that, first of all, note down very carefully to whom you are issuing the share. Presume you are the acquirer entity H limited. So you have to issue the shares to the other entity, acquiry entity that is S limited. So number of shares of S limited, first of all, you note down. How many number of shares of S limited are there? 80. Now write, see here how I have written. For every two shares, we will have to issue five shares. 
for every two share put it in denominator we have to issue five shares put it in the numerator so this way around you will derive this particular figure that how many number of shares you are supposed to issue so it means now you will have to issue 200 shares to the edge limited so far in this particular question still there is no clue that it is a case of reverse acquisition we are simply moving according to the information and automatically you will find that how it is a, how it becomes a case of reverse acquisition so far there is no hint but we have computed how many shares will have to be issued by H limited to S limited. Now, when H limited will issue 100 shares to S limited, what will be the position of the group? The group will be the group will be uh, the will be comprised by investor entity that is H limited, and of course our acquiry entity S limited. This is the group. Now see here in the group. After issuance of 200 shares to S limited, what is the position of number of shares in the group now? Just pay attention here. Group is comprising of H limited and S limited, correct? Total number of shares of H limited is 100. Total number of shares of H limited is 100. And now H limited has issued 200 shares to S limited. So total number of share in the group now will become 300. Out of 300, 100 shares are held by H limited, but 200 shares are in the hands of S limited. So now you can see total number of share in the group is equal to 300 and out of that only one third is in the hands of H limited legal acquiry. While legal acquiry is having 200 share. Now on the basis of their shareholding, now we can conclude actually in the group majority of the shares that is more than 50 percent share are in the hands of the legal acquiry so that is why legal acquiry will be presumed as having control of this particular entity i hope mahima you got now how we have to figure out that it is a case of reverse acquisition or not correct this total number of share in the group is 300 and out of that 200 shares are held by as I told you, legal acquiry. So legal acquiry S limited now will be considered as an accounting acquirer for the purpose of accounting. So here I have written also, since S limited holds two third stakes of the group, control shall be considered in the hands of S limited and thus S limited shall be treated as an accounting acquirer. Is it clear to you? So now, now you have to look at this way round. You are, you have now become the legal, you have become now from legal perspective to accounting acquirer. In technical terms, now you are the accounting acquirer. So now entire accounting will be done in your books. Entire accounting will be done in your books. It means now you will have to do the accounting by presuming it this way around. Now you will have to presume it that you are taking over the business of S, S limited. All the assets of H Limited and their liability will be taken by what we call legal uh, by the accounting acquirer because now you have become the accounting acquirer. Now, how to prepare the journal entry in the books of in the books of what we call accounting acquirer? This will be exactly what question will ask you in the examination. Journal in the books of S Limited and S Limited has become accounting acquirer. Now, if you are the accounting acquirer, now it will be presumed that you are taking over the business of H Limited. So, indirectly, it means you will take over all the assets and all the liability of H Limited. So, you will have to look very carefully into the column of H Limited. What is the first figure in the column of S Limited? Their non-current assets. So, you will take over their non-current assets. Generally, the entries are passed at fair value. But no fair values are given in the question. So, we are presuming whatever value of S Limited are appearing in the balance sheet are equal to the fair value. Correct? Then similarly, you will take over their current assets also. Right now, there is no goodwill. So, first write to non-current liability. You will take over their non-current liability also, their current liability also then you will have to pay some consideration. Now the next big question will be, what amount of consideration now you are going to discharge to the H limited? This is another important question, correct? In order to know what will be the amount of purchase consideration which will be discharged by S limited to H limited, how we compute that? How we compute that? 
So in order to compute that, what you will have to do, first of all, find out the number of shares of H Limited. Number of shares of H Limited. How many number of shares of H Limited are there in the question? What is the number of shares of H Limited? Number of shares of H Limited in the question is given 100. 1000 divided by 10. So total number of shares of H Limited is equal to 100. But it is also given in the question that quoted price, quoted price of H Limited is 20. That means fair value because quoted price is nothing but fair value. So S Limited will definitely make a payment equal to 100 number of share into their market price. This is market price or quoted price, whatever you may like to write. That means total worth of purchase consideration will have to be discharged by. This is another important point where you are going to get a little bit of trouble. So make just pay attention and try to understand how you have to compute the amount of consideration. So in order to compute the amount of consideration, you will have to find out number of shares of the other entity. Who is the other entity now? That is H limited. H limited. Now, is there any fair value given? Right. Their fair value is given 20. So then you multiply number of share with their, their fair value. The fair value is 20. So 2000 is the worth of 100 share. So total fair value of 100 shares of H limited is equal to 2000. Is it clear to you? So now you are going to make a payment of rupees 2000. So consideration will be considered as 2000. So this is the first entry which you are going to pass. Obviously, through this entry, you can derive the figure of goodwill also. The balancing figure will become goodwill. Is it clear to you? Fine. Once it has become clearer to everyone, the next point which you need to understand is you have determined that this is the amount of purchase consideration which you are supposed to pay to the other entity. Now you are actually S limited. Other entity is H limited. You are the accounting acquirer S limited. You are paying a consideration to H limited. You found the consideration that is equal to 2000. Then another question will now follow. Now how many shares you are going to? How many shares? How many shares you will have to issue to the other entity? To discharge actually 2000 worth of consideration. How many shares you are going to discharge? This is another question which will unfold before you. So in order to know how many shares you are going to issue to the other entity so that they can be made a payment equal to 2000. In order to, in order to know how many shares you are going to issue to the other entity, you will have to divide the amount of purchase consideration by the quoted market, market price of your own share or fair value of your own share. Now, fair value of S limited given in the question is 50. Is it clear to you? So by dividing 2000 by 50, you will conclude that you are going to issue 40 shares. 40 shares you are going to issue. That means you are going to issue 40 shares. 40 shares. Is it clear to you? 40 shares at the rate of 50 you are going to issue. Is it clear to you? So by dividing the purchase consideration by your own quoted market price or your own fair value, you will come to the conclusion how many shares we are going to deliver to the other entity. Now you are issuing 40 shares at the rate of 50. But actually the position is that face value of your share is 10 and the difference will be considered as premium. That means we are issuing 40 share at the rate of 50. It means 40 share having a nominal value of 10 each are being issued at the rate of 50. So that means these 40 shares are being issued by your company at a premium of what we call 50. So when we will pass the entry for payment of consideration, when we will pass the entry for payment of consideration, entry will be like this. Consideration account debit 2000. I will write here equity share capital. See total number of share 40 and face value is 10. Face value is 10. So 400 and two security premium, 40 share and premium is 40 per share. So total will become 1600. I hope it is clear to everyone. How we have computed this number of share I have also shown here by way of working. Is it clear to you? So these are the two entries which you are supposed to pass correct as a what we call accounting acquirer.
So whatever assets of the other entities are there, you will take them over, their liabilities you are going to take them over, then you will write simply consideration. The difference will be considered as goodwill or gain on bargain purchase. If the difference will be towards the debit side, obviously it will be goodwill. If on the credit side, it will be considered as gain on bargain purchase. Then another important point is how many number of shares you are going to actually issue. So how you have to compute that, you need to know that. So once you have computed this, finally you are supposed to prepare consolidated balance sheet. In my regular classes, if you remember, actually, I told you whenever we prepare balance sheet, especially the consolidated balance sheet, as we know that acquirer, now accounting acquirer is S limited. Accounting acquirer is S limited. Correct? Obviously, all the items of acquirer will find place in the balance sheet and whatever assets and liability you have taken of the other entity that is S limited, you will note those assets and liability in the consolidated balance sheet by consolidating those figures with your own figures. But important point is that although in this question fair values are not given, but if there would have been any fair value, we would have taken the assets and liability of the other entity at fair value. So we will add the items of the other entity at fair value. But items of acquirer will always come in the balance sheet, will always come in the balance sheet at carrying value. This is the important point which you need to keep in mind while preparing the what we call consolidated balance sheet. Whether fair values of acquirer company, sometime in order to confuse you, it could be a possibility that in the examination question may tell you that fair value of so and so item of acquirer company is this much. No treatment is needed in that case. Is it clear to you? For example, just pay attention here. Consolidated balance sheet I will have to prepare. First of all, we will start with assets because we have to prepare the balance sheet as per division 2. I have already told you. All such companies which follow India's, they need to prepare their financial as per Division 2. And under Division 2, assets are written first. Is it clear to you? So first of all, I will write non-current asset. Under non-current asset, first of all, look into the column of the acquirer. Now, value of non-current asset is 3000 of the acquirer company. Now, suppose if in this particular question, fair value or fair value of non-current asset of acquirer company would have been, let us say, given 5,000. Still, I would have written here 3,000. Is it clear to you or not? That means while preparing the balance sheet, only the carrying value of the acquirer will be taken. Is it clear? While now, now I will have to wash the entry. Now, in the entry, it is written that we have taken over the non-current assets of the other entity. So, 2,000 I am going to add here. So, total value will be 5,000. Is it clear to you? Likewise, I will write first of all my own value that is accounting acquirers. That is 1,000 and I have taken over now your current asset at a value of rupees 2,000. I will add here. Besides that, there is a goodwill. So, I should not actually let it skip out of my memory to write 502. So, consolidate it total of asset side is equal to 7500. Now coming over to the liability side, pay attention. In the liability side, first of all, we always write equity. Under equity, two items, we write share capital and other equity. So many times I have already told you while preparing the consolidated balance sheet, only the share capital, only the share capital of acquirer finds place and acquirer is S limited. Their own share capital is 800. Now, before you write share capital, just have a look over the two entries which you have passed here. In the entries, you have written here two equity share capital also because you have issued some equity share capital through the other entity. So that is the reason your equity share capital will move up by 400. So that is why I have written here 1200. This is entire share capital of acquirer entity only. In the balance sheet, only acquirers, only acquirer share capital will find place. Is it clear to you? Then other equity. First of all, you will write the other equity of the legal acquire of the accounting acquirer. That is 1,600. S Limited's other equity is 1,600. I have already told you under India S ended in three, we never write the other equity of the acquiry entity. So we will not take over the other equity of the other entity because their other equity will already get exhausted. Suppose if I would have had prepared the goodwill. That is the reason. 
correct so their equity and their share capital will never find place in the balance sheet now our own equity is 1600 but again you have to exercise caution because you have issued the share capital at a premium and security premium is also a part of equity so your other equity will move up by 1600 so that is why in the outer column you will write 3200 is it clear to you and then non-current liability your own current liability is 1200 and you have taken over their non-current liability also so total will be 1900 and similar is the situation with respect to current liability your total will be 7500 is it clear to you or not so how we have to do the questions of reverse acquisitions that should become absolutely clear to each and everyone is it clear to you is it clear to everyone or not is it clear and good thing regarding reverse acquisition is that there is hardly any variety in it so in case if you will get a question that question will be on similar lines because there is no room for any other what we call variations under it but only thing is that with only thing is that just to make the point a little bit more clear i told you if there would have been some fair value of let us say h limited because this time you are the accounting acquirer suppose fair value of other entity would have been given let us say fair value of some other value besides these these items some fair values are given obviously in that case you would have had passed the entry with the fair value here you would have had passed the entry with the fair value correct so obviously in that particular case when you would prepare the balance sheet you will include the items with fair value but your own items will appear at carrying value this is the point important which you need to carry in your mind correct to face and tackle such problems so this is with respect to what we call reverse acquisition besides reverse acquisition in this case there is another topic that is common control topic correct now we come over to common control this is another area where I feel that this time you might actually get a question, might get a question from this particular concept, correct? Common control question, common control. What we mean by common control? What we mean by common control? Actually, there are, when we are explaining the concept of common control, here we will take into account the merger, spin-off, sale of division. What are, what? all these things stand for i will let you know in a short while just pay attention here presume that there is an organization there is an organization and further presume that this organization has got two divisions correct it is a big organization and it has got two divisions one is division a and another one is division b is it clear now let us say the, uh, these are the two divisions of this particular organization let us say one particular division is specializing in a particular uh, intuition institute is going to ask direct question from CMA. That is the good thing. In fact, we that is why we are quite famed for because we have included all such questions. Correct? The last time in the last class when we did some questions, those questions were from CA module. To be very honest with you, I have already taken care of this particular point and your area is correct. Correct? So that is the reason you need not require to bother. So completely bank upon the material which we have already supplied. I can assure you, you are not going to get a single question outside that. So A limited and B limited. We are presuming that A limited is uh, involved or engaged in a particular product and B limited is engaged in a particular product. Now this is the organization. This organization has got two divisions. And due to some or other reason, let us say this particular organization has decided to sell one division. So they have decided to, let us say, they have decided to sell division B. Perhaps division D might be incurring some losses. So that was, that might be the a logical possible reason behind this particular decision. Now, let us say this particular entity, uh, this organization, whatever this organization is, this big organization who is having what we call two divisions, they have decided to sell off one division B and they have decided to sell it to a new company, let us say company C. Now try to understand. Suppose there is a big tree, correct? Let us say this is a big tree. And suddenly in the big tree, let us say there are some mangoes or some other fruits, whatever you may like, correct? And if one fruit will get plucked, the size of that particular tree in accounting language we may say has demersed has demersed similarly here the organization was earlier having two division 
Now this organization has sold out one division. So its size will reduce and in accounting jargon we call it as demerged entity. This organization will be known as demerged entity. Is it clear to you or not? Is it clear? Demerge is just opposite of merger. When two entities will merge together, they, their size will become bigger. And demerger is opposite of merger because now our size is getting reduced because we are selling down one division. So this entity has sold one division. And this process of selling one division to the other entity is known as demerger. This process is known as demerger or it is also known as split off. It is also known as split off because one division is getting a split out of this particular organization. So this organization will be considered as demerged entity. This is the demerged entity. Correct. Why it has become a demerged entity? Because one division is being sold out to the other entity. The process will be known as demerger or split off. Now the next point. Next point is that because entity C is taking over entity B, quite obviously entity C will not take it at free of cost. It will have to make some payment. Remember one thing, here entity C will become acquirer entity because now entity C is taking over B limited, you can say it that way out. So entity C will become the acquirer entity. Is it clear to you? Now this entity will have to make some payment against taking over the business. So there are various possibilities. One possibility is that actually this division belongs to this particular organization and this organization is considered as a demersed entity. Is it clear to you? Demersed entity. Don't let it skip out of your what we call memory. Now new company. So various possibility is that one possibility is that new company may decide to discharge the consideration to this particular organization directly. And I have written here, purchase consideration given directly to demersed entity. So if the new company would decide that we are going to discharge the amount of purchase consideration directly to the demersed entity, then it will be considered as a case of common control. It will be considered as a case of common control. It will be considered as a case of common control. Actually, what we mean by common control? First of all, let me clarify it because I have seen actually student fraternity. They simply uh, cram it, but they never understand the meaning of that. Actually, both these divisions were under the control of this particular organization. No doubt about that earlier, isn't it or not? Because they are our division. So the, obviously I'm controlling these two division. Now one division is moving out. And that this particular division has gone into the hands of this particular entity, entity C. But important point is that entity C has delivered the shares to us. Entity C has delivered the shares to us. Indirectly, it means now entity C is also in our control. So instead of this particular company, now entity C will be under our control and entity C has taken over this particular entity. So it means under common control, the situation is status quo as we, as we call it. Status quo basically means it is similar to the original position because earlier we were having the control over A and B. Now company A has been, company B has been sold to company C. So now we are controlling company A and controlling uh, and what we call company C. So that is why it is known as common control. Put it in more simpler words. It means now the division, one division which is still with you and the new division which has acquired your this division, the new division is still also in your control. So that is why it will be considered as a case of common control. Now, if it becomes a case of common control, how it will affect the accounting? Because generally when we do the accounting, that process is known as acquisition method. That process is known as acquisition method. Actually, whatever accounting which we have done so far in this particular chapter, that is as per acquisition method. Because India's 103 applies, uh, India's 103 prescribes actually acquisition method. Correct? Whatever procedure which we have adopted so far in solving the question, that is as per acquisition method. But under common control, acquisition method will not apply. Here I have written also. Acquisition method will not apply and here pooling interest method shall apply. Now what we mean by pooling interest method? First of all, how we are going to pass the entries, I will give a bit of idea regarding that. Correct? 
in the books of demersed entity don't let it skip out of your mind the meaning of demersed entity the organization who was having two divisions and who sold out one division this division will be considered this organization is your demersed entity because it is selling out one of its division this division this pooling interest method yes somebody told me as per as 14 you are absolutely right we will talk about that also but just pay attention here now in this case this is the demersed entity so first of all whenever the question would be struck in from this particular topic they are going to ask you pass the entries in the books of demersed entity now whenever in accounts you do the accounting presume you are that particular organization whose accounting is being asked correct so because the question is asking you to pass the entry in the demersed entity you similarly presume or personify yourself as if you are the chief accountant correct if this position seems low you consider yourself as the ceo of that this particular organization you view the things from the perspective of the business so one of your division is moving out one of your division is moving out means all the assets and liabilities of do, of that particular division are moving out so that is the reason in the books of in the books of demersed entity your first entry will be for assets and liabilities which you have transferred to the other entity which you have there is no need to cram simply understand the logic very simple people may think it is a very complicated topic actually it's a very simple topic let me assure you just pay attention in this case one of your division is moving out if your division is moving out that mean assets of that divisions are going out now if divisions of that assets are going out if assets would move out would you debit it or credit it would you debit it or credit it think on such lines if your assets are moving out are you going to debit it or credit it obviously you are going to credit so whatever assets are moving out you simply put them on the credit side correct obviously if your liabilities because your liabilities are also moving out indirectly your liabilities are getting reduced so that is why all those liability which you are transferring to the other entity correct you are going to put it on the debit side so all the assets and liabilities you are going to record it correct for transfer of assets and for transfer of liability correct now you are transferring this as these assets and liabilities to a company known as new company here the company c you can say you will debit that particular company why you are going to debit that particular question uh, particular company reason being is that because you are transferring your assets and liabilities to the other company this is new company c obviously you will charge some price correct this company will not take over assets and liability neither you would be willing to give them free of cost so obviously you are going to demand some consideration and new company is bound to pay you some consideration is it clear to you so because new company is bound to pay you they haven't paid you still so first of all you are going to debit them that mean new company is your data entity is your data entity actually when we will put the entry we will simply write new company account debit we will write whatever liabilities which are moving out we will debit them and we will debit all the assets which are moving out of the business obviously the difference of these the difference of these could be on the debit side or could be on the credit side but first of all pay attention if difference is on the credit side if difference is on the credit side always write capital reserve always write capital reserve here don't use the word gain on bargain purchase why because you are putting the entries in the books of in the books of demersed entity demersed entity is not an acquirer entity in days 103 or in days 14 sorry in days 103 or accounting existing accounting standard as 14 they are related to accounting in the books of acquirer they are not related to what we call at all for accounting in the books of the other entity is it so here general principles of accounts are being used here no indas we are not following any indas at this particular book uh, at this particular moment that mean whenever we are going to pass the entry in the books of demersed entity as per which accounting standard which are passing the entries no accounting standard only simple general accounting principles we are applying is it clear to you sometime they are going to ask you this question in the interview note it down 
when after some time you are going to appear for some interview especially with the leading company they are going to toss up such questions what principles you follow when you pass the entry in the books of acquiry entity or dima here actually i do not want to use the word acquiry entity dima's entity we are not following any indias neither we are following any accounting standard neither any indian accounting standard indias we are simply following general accounting principles is it clear to you number 1 number 2 if the balance will appear towards the credit side it will be considered as a gain and this gain is of capital nature what are capital nature gains let me take a test of okay clarify me what if, when you are going to consider a gain as a capital gain this question i should ask actually toss up before a class 11th student and you are almost now in you are in final 11 and almost on the brink of becoming cma what are what are capital nature gains what are capital nature gains this is suppose vinay kumar if you are going to give such answer uh, the interviewer are going to get very angry let me tell you i am not getting angry don't worry about that but i didn't expect such sort of answers special gains no 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 not at all i am simply asking you a very simple question what we mean by capital nature gain any gain that is the reason i am telling you you prepare simply by studying the things will not help you later on in lending up with a very good job not a capital see raja gopalan you have to be careful capital appreciation of course is a gain again pay attention and let me also tell you and caution you one thing suppose tomorrow you are actually facing an interview and sometime it may happen actually it could happen to anyone is suppose you are feeling that you are not in a position to deliver that particular answer your answer at that time should be sorry sir i am not in a position right now to deliver a concise answer to this particular question so i am sorry i can't explain it you simply say this instead of unnecessarily stretching the answer anyway now let me tell you any gain which accrues to an entity not because of actually any gain which accrues to an entity on account of what we call sale of goods or an or on account of sale of services is known as revenue nature gain that mean any other gain from any other source which the entity actually gets considered as capital nature gain is it clear to you any gain which flows to an entity not because of what we call sale of goods or services will be considered as capital gain so here we are deriving the gain because of selling of what we call one division so anyway if it is a gain you are always going to write the word capital reserve actually there is a lot of controversy with respect to debit side if there is a balance towards the debit side actually unfortunately i have seen in some module they have written here goodwill never write here goodwill in case of common control is it clear to you in case of common control if the balancing figure towards the debit side never ever write goodwill whether it is written in your module or not leave it what i am trying to tell you just pay attention in case of because way back some i think one of the student asked me this particular question sir on the debit side it should be goodwill no you will never ever treat it as goodwill number 1 number 2 number 2 here if the balancing figure arise either you can debit capital reserve either you can debit first of all when we have a balance on the debit side it means our entity is incurring a loss number 1 now this loss can be debited to capital reserve but you should debit capital reserve only if you are having some credit balance in the capital reserve are you getting my point or not that mean indirectly it means you are setting up this loss against the capital reserve suppose if in the balance sheet you are not having any capital reserve then you debit it to general reserve or to profit and loss account your first priority should be to debit it to capital reserve but you will debit it only if your organization is having your organization is having a capital reserve if your organization is not having capital reserve then you can debit it to general reserve or to profit and loss account is it clear to you 
how you are going to pass the first entry don't cram it for god's sake simply go for the logic we are transferring our assets assets are moving out credit them our liabilities are moving out debit them and they are passing they these items are being passed on to a new company so we are supposed to receive some money from the new company obviously the new company will be debited only three things you have to write the then balancing figure if the balancing figure towards the credit side you will write capital reserve if the balancing figure is on the debit side you have to exercise a bit of caution here your first priority should be to consider capital reserve but only if there is an existing balance in your organization if there is no capital reserve then simply write general reserve or profit and loss account it is your prerogative another important point after you have passed the first entry then in the books of demerged entity you have to pass the entry for consideration because now you have sold out your business you have to receive some amount from the other entity now again two types of situation may unfold as i was talking about the one situation is that consideration is being received by the demerged entity with respect to consideration one situation is that new company may deliver the amount of purchase consideration directly to the demerged entity in that case you will simply pass the entry shares in new company account debit because generally in case of common control new company will deliver you purchase consideration in the form of shares only although they may give you some cash on rare occasions so at that time you also debit the cash that means whatever you are going to receive from the new company you are going to write it on the debit side and simply write to new company account correct with respect to consideration two possibilities are there correct one possibility is that one possibility is that if the consideration has been directly received by the demerged entity if the demerged entity would receive the consideration entry is very simple correct now just wait for a second i told you this business was sold to the new company and i told you there are various possibility the one possibility is that they may deliver the consideration directly to the demerged entity actually if it is given in the question that consideration has been received by the demerged entity then it becomes easier because it becomes easier to know that it is a case of common control however there are other situation also new company may decide and remember one thing it is the right of the new company whether they want to give the consideration to the organization or they may deliver the consideration to the members of the merged entity members members means the shareholders so consideration may be delivered by new company directly to the organization or they may decide new company may decide to give the consideration to the members of the demerged entity members of purchasing company i have written you write here members of demerged entity members of demerged entity so there are two options available with the new company option number 1 they can deliver the what we will consideration to the directly to the organization that is demerged entity or they may decide to deliver the consideration to the members of the demerged entity shareholders of the demerged entity now if in the question and generally whenever in the examination you are going to get the question correct it will be written like this that new company has delivered the consideration to the members of demerged entity if the consideration has been given to members members correct when i say members it means members of demerged entity or shareholders of demerged entity if consideration has been given to members there are three possibility one possibility is that one possibility is that which i have written here just wait if purchase consideration given to shareholders of demerged entity then situation number 1 one of the shareholders holds more than 50% of the shares what does it mean new company has given purchase consideration to the members and one of the member and one of the member is having more than 50% stakes in the new company if such a scenario is there then it will be considered as then it will be considered as a case of common control because new company has given the purchase consideration to the members and one of the member is having more than 50% stake in the new company that mean this new company is in the hands of the members and members belong to the organization that mean new company is still in the is still under the what we call fold of organization demerged organization 
that is why it will be considered as a case of common control is it clear to you because the control of the new company is still lying in the hands of the demerged entity how because purchase consideration was delivered to the members of demerged entity and one of the members are having more than 50% stake in the new company on account of this so this particular company is controlled by that particular member and that member belongs to demerged entity is it clear to you second situation purchase consideration is delivered by the new company to the member and none of the shareholder of the demerged entity holds more than 50% stakes now under the second scenario new company is giving purchase consideration to the member but this time none of the member is having 50% control so in this case it will not be considered as a case of common control it will not be considered as a case of common control if it is not considered as a case of common control it means while doing accounting in the books of new company while doing accounting in the books of new company we will have to apply india s 103 under common control when we will do accounting in the books of new company india s 103 will not apply as viray kumar earlier told actually pooling interest method is applied that is nothing but prescribed by as 40 is it clear to you under common control in the books of new company we are going to do the accounting as per pooling interest method actually pooling interest method has been given under appendix 26 of india 103 and that is very similar to as 14 methodology anyway so in the books of new company either you are going to apply pooling interest method but pooling interest method will be applied when it is a case of common control if it is not a case of common control then you are going to apply simply india's 103 accounting correct as we were doing now there could be another scenario there are three scenario when new company decides to deliver the purchase consideration to the member one i told you purchasing company has given consideration to the members and one of the member is having more than 50 percent stakes then it becomes a case of common control scenario two purchasing company is giving purchase consideration to the members of the company and none of the member is having more than 50 percent stakes so it is not a case of common control scenario three it is given in the question that purchasing company is delivering purchase consideration to the members but no information is being given in the question whether any member is having more than 50 percent stakes or not or neither it is given that none of the member is having 50 percent if question is silent then presume always it is a case of common control is it clear to you so you need to understand that case of common control generally will be there but only under one exceptional circumstances the case will be of acquisition method and this happens when new company decides to give the purchase consideration to the members and none of the member will have more than 50 percent stakes in the new company then only we will have to apply in days 103 otherwise in the books of new company we will apply pooling interest method anyway so first of all i was trying to tell you in the books of demerged entity because demerged entity is not an acquirer entity so i have just told those who have joined me late correct i told initially that here we are not applying any indias we are not applying any indias we are not applying any accounting standard any existing accounting standard what we are applying simple general accounting principles to record the things so in the books of demerged entity i have already talked about the first entry and i was talking about the second entry now we have to receive the consideration now if consideration is to be received by us we will pass very simple entry shares in new company account debit to new company but if it is given in the question that consideration has been received by members of demerged entity if it is given in the question this way around that consideration has been received by members of demerged entity you presume that you are the demerged entity because we are doing entry in the books of demerged entity correct we have sold our division b to the new company and new company has decided to pay purchase consideration to the members to the members to the members because when we sold the business indirectly it means we have transferred all the assets and liability 
of this particular division to the new company and against that we are supposed to receive some purchase consideration that is why in the first entry we have debited the new company but the problem is that but the problem is that new company hasn't given the purchase consideration to us instead they decided to give it to the members so what entry now i am going to pass now in this case your entry will be see here when new company will pay the amount of consideration to the member new company will make a phone call to the demerged entity that we have delivered the purchase consideration but we have delivered the purchase consideration to your members so because new company has has actually uh, uh, obligated their obligations indirectly it means they have already met their obligation because they were supposed to give us some amount and they have given the purchase consideration so there is no point in now debiting the new company because new company has discharged its obligation so that is the reason now i will have to credit it credit the new company even though i am not receiving anything from the new company i am the demerged entity this time consideration has been received by members an amount is not received by me amount is not received by me so it will be considered as a loss to me are you getting my point or not so it will be considered as a loss to me now as per the general principles of accounting if there is a loss your first priority should be to debit it to your capital reserve but you should debit it to capital reserve only if you are having existing balance in the capital reserve if you are not having any existing balance then it would be better to debit profit and loss account or general reserve account is it clear to you or not that is the difference between general account general accounting principles and the principle as per laid out uh, as per laid out standards so two possibilities are there and accordingly you are going to pass the entry in the books of demerged entity and it is very simple to pass the entry it is not at all a very tough task is it clear after that the question will ask you to prepare a balance sheet after the demerger the movement word balance sheet comes a student fraternity i have seen they develop a scale as if this questioner is asking you to scale the mountain everest without having an oxygen cylinder nothing like that preparation of balance sheet of the demerged entity is almost like a stroll in the park correct it is almost like a cup of tea allow me to have a sip of tea very simple see here you were having the demerged entity that this is the demerged entity now demerged entity was earlier having two divisions division a and division b obviously there might be some assets there might be some liabilities there might be some liabilities of this division because we have transferred this particular division and all the assets and liabilities of these divisions have gone out so whatever remaining will find place in the balance sheet it is as simple as that is it clear to you or not so that mean only division which is left with you only items of that division now will figure in the new balance sheet it is very simple so no problem you are going to confront in preparing the balance sheet of this entity now coming over to the new in the books of new company now new company is it an acquirer company or acquiry company first let me know of that new company is acquirer entity or acquiry entity new company is acquirer entity or acquiry entity company c in this case company c is taking over company b because division b is being sold to actually company c so company c will be considered as acquiry company or acquirer entity acquirer entity santhana gave the answer vinay kumar purchasing company yes technically speaking vinay kumar is absolutely to the hilt right instead of using the word acquirer even i should use the word purchasing company to be very honest with you because this entire process is covered by common control and this entire process if it is being if it is being covered by common control even i should avoid the word using acquirer instead you can use the word purchasing company so in the books of new company so because we are dealing up with acquirer acquirer that is why i am telling it is an acquirer entity but more specifically you will call it as a purchasing company is it clear to you 
सो इन द बुक्स ऑफ न्यू कंपनी न्यू कंपनी एक्वायर एंटिटी और परचेसिंग कंपनी इज इट क्लियर टू यू नाउ दिस इज अ केस ऑफ कॉमन कंट्रोल इफ इट इज अ केस ऑफ कॉमन कंट्रोल ऑब्वियसली वी कैन नॉट अप्लाई इन द एस थ्री we cannot apply india s3 then what we are going to apply first of all what does india s ended in three states india s ended in three states that on the date of acquisition acquirer entity or purchasing entity will record all the assets and liability at fair value but here we are not going to use india s ended in three then what we are going to use we are going to use appendix of india s ended in three we are going to use appendix on common control appendix on common control states that states that we have to use pooling interest method and pooling interest method is similar to the method which is prescribed by as 14 which you will learn under amalgamation correct now as per pooling interest method you need not require to actually get unnecessary jitters it is not a big problem it is similar to actually india ended in 3 accounting don't worry about it. but just pay attention as per common control correct then we will apply appendix c indirectly when we will apply the pooling interest method the new company will record all the asset now we are the new company presume you are the accountant of company c now you are receiving some assets from division b so obviously you are going to debit the asset whatever assets which you have received from division b you have received some liabilities you are going to credit those liability now against taking over these assets and liability you have to pay some amount so you will write consideration also important thing is that see here i have written only book values shall be considered that is the basic difference between pooling interest method and acquisition method acquisition method is prescribed by india ended in 3 because under acquisition method we take into account fair value whereas under common control we have to pass the entry in the books of purchasing company or acquirer entity as per what we call pooling interest method and pooling interest method says that all the assets and liabilities shall be taken over and taken over at book value only at book value only that mean even if fair values are given we will consider book value number 1 number 2 here i have written no new assets will be recognized now no new asset will be recognized is not given under as 14 it is given under appendix appendix deals with common control correct and common control says pooling interest method will be applied and pooling interest method says that all the assets and liability will be recorded at book value only that is carrying value only number 1 and no new asset will be recognized what does it mean generally in the books of acquirer generally in the books of acquirer you have seen actually we take the difference either as goodwill or we take the difference as gain on bargain purchase isn't it or not in the books of acquirer generally we take the difference correct as gain on bargain purchase or capital reserve but here if the balance will come towards the credit side you will consider it as capital reserve if the balance will come towards the credit side don't use the word gain on bargain purchase because under pooling interest method we use only word capital reserve don't don't use the word what we call right you absolutely so we will write here capital reserve only avoid actually messaging when i am discussing something correct anyway so capital reserve if the balance will appear towards the credit side on the debit side i have seen there are many modules i have seen there are many modules who are using the word goodwill even under case of common control and that is why student fraternity derives confusion because we have become accustomed to actually writing debit balance as goodwill without knowing the repercussions where it should be used so point is that on the credit side under common control we have to write capital reserve at if the balance appears towards to towards the debit side you will again use the word capital reserve you will again use the word capital reserve because if i am going to write here goodwill that mean i am going to violate this condition new asset is being recognized actually the appendix says says that no new asset should be recognized 
So no new asset should be recognized. That is why I cannot write here goodwill. So it is always better to write whether the, whether the difference is on the debit side or credit side. But let me also clarify. Capital reserve having debit balance is nothing but goodwill. See, capital reserve having debit balance means capital loss. And what does goodwill mean? Goodwill also means capital loss for the paying entity. For the paying entity, goodwill is nothing but capital loss. So actually capital reserve debit balance is nothing but goodwill. But we will avoid using the, using the word goodwill here. Is it clear to you or not? So in the books of acquirer entity, or the purchasing company, we will use the pooling interest method and pooling interest method says that we have to take only the book figures. We have, we should not recognize any new asset means even if the balance is on the debit side, avoid you writing the word goodwill. So this is how you are going to pass the entry in the books of new company. Now suppose, now suppose I am new company, correct? Assets liability. So whatever assets I have taken, I, I will write here in my balance sheet and whatever liabilities I have taken over, I will write it on the balance sheet because later on we will see that question will also ask you to pass to prepare balance sheet in the books of new company, which again is not at all a very tough task. Is it clear to you? Whatever assets, as per the entry, you will simply note down assets, note down the liability. Then you will make the payment for the consideration. You are the purchasing company. You have to ultimately make the purchase payment for the purchase consideration. Either you will pay directly to the demolished entity or you are going to make the payment to the members. But you have to make the payment. When you will make the payment, you will debit the consideration and then you will write here to share capital. So you have passed two entries. So whatever share capital you have written over here, you are going to put it in the balance sheet also and your balance sheet will automatically get tallied and if there is a debit balance in capital reserve you will write it as a debit item if there is a credit balance then you will write it as a positive item in the balance sheet it is as simple as that to prepare the balance sheet also but one important point here i have also written one of the condition also with respect to appendix c is that consideration under common control i'm talking about one of one of the condition also is that consideration must be recorded at nominal value consideration must be recorded at nominal value must be recorded at nominal value what does it mean suppose if in the question it is given that purchasing company is paying 100 lakhs rupees by way of shares but at a premium of 10%, let us say, it means purchasing company is making a payment of 110 lakhs by in including the premium amount. Then as per the guidelines of this particular appendix, which deals with pooling interest method, I will write here only 100. That is the nominal value. That is the face value. This is the point. And in my regular classes, I have explained this very deeply that whether I write here 110 or 100, ultimately the net effect will be same. Correct? But it is not possible to explain that here in the revisionary session because it consumes lots of time. Those who have attended my regular classes, they know actually that I have explained over there whether we write here 110 or 100. Ultimately, the net effect will be same, but we have to follow the dictates of the what we call uh, the guidelines. The guideline says that share capital will be reflected only at face value. So write the amount of consideration at face value only and ignore the security premium at all. And even when you are going to make the payment right here, 100 and make the payment 100. Is it clear to you or not? So these are the points which you have to take care while doing the accounting in the books of acquirer entity, technically called as purchasing company under common control. Correct? Under common control, only difference is that when we are going to take over the assets and liability, we will take them at fair, not at fair value, rather at carrying value. Another important point is that consideration will be recorded at nominal value or face value as we call it. And another important point is that even if the balance would appear on the debit side, we should refrain ourselves from using the word goodwill, rather simply write capital reserve, but in the bracket you can write goodwill, that's a different matter. So that examiner understands that you know the proper, what we call precadamments of all the guidelines, correct? That when I use the word predicament, it means even the minutest of the, uh, minutest of the details. So you can write in bracket goodwill, but write capital reserve.
Is it clear to you? Because debit balance in capital reserve is nothing but goodwill. So this is how you are going to pass the entry and question will also ask you to actually pass entries in uh, prepare the balance sheet and I have already told you by having a look over the over these two entries you will have to prepare the balance sheet. This is how you will have to go about while doing the question. Is it clear to you? Give me five minutes and after that I will show you through some practical through one practical the entire process. Correct? After five minutes just because I am also tired of speaking at length. Correct? And remember henceforth classes will be taken off from the videos. Don't actually run away and don't miss the classes. Correct? It is your duty to watch the sessions at the stipulated period of time. And the next chapter which we are going to start that will deal up with amalgamation and just in the beginning of the session I have told you that whatever topics are there, those topics, those topics will be covered along with amalgamation because those topics are related to amalgamation. And personally feeling, personally I hope that I will be able to finish up amalgamation within one class itself. Anyway, after five minutes I will meet you. Control. Now in order to understand the common control, just a very small example I am putting up so that you become a little bit deft in it. Suppose there is an organization, correct? And we presume that it has got two divisions, A division, division A and division B. And let us say on the asset side of this particular organization, there are some items appearing like this, property, plant and equipment. Property, plant and equipment, let us say written down value. Written down value, let us say is 50. Let us say is 200. And total is, if you want to frame another column, you can frame 250 is the total property, plant and equipment of the organization. Correct. And then second, current asset. I have written CA in short form. Current asset 400. And what figure should I write? Okay, 1000. Then I will write here 1400. So this is the total of the asset side. Total assets of division A is equal to 450. Total division of B, total assets of B is equal to 1200. And total assets of the organization is 1650. Correct? Then towards the equity and liability side, let us say this particular entity is having equity share capital. And we presume that face value of per share is 10. 50 I have written here and I have written here nothing 50 and then we have written here other equity other equity is 150 and negative 200 negative 200 that mean entity B is incurring some losses it could be a possibility and in the outer column I write I write what okay I will make it 350 350 minus 200 is equal to 150 correct and then I will write here liabilities on the liability side I have written here non-current liability nil then 600 and in the outer column 600 and one more item current liability that is 50 and here I write uh, 600 I think it will be equal to this much and then I should write here 800 then only it will become 1200 so in the outer column I will write here 850 correct so total will be equal to 450 this total will be equal to 1200 and this total will be equal to 1650 so this is the organization and this organization is having two divisions A and B is it clear to you Further, let us say it is written in the question, let us say it is written that division B is transferred to a new company, is transferred to a new company, transferred to a new company and we further presume that the name of the new company is X limited. Also, let us say it is given X limited issued, X limited issued. 2 lakh shares, 2 lakh shares, we presume all these figures are in lakhs, 2 lakh shares of rupees 10 each, of rupees 10 each at a premium of rupees 50, at a premium 
of rupees 15 per share at a premium of rupees 15 per share to the members of to the members of demerged entity to the members of demerged entity dm entity means demerged entity i have to save the time also what can i do i have to use the short forms a lot so this is the question now in this particular question there are two division first of all let me know of you which division is being sold out division b is being sold out it is being sold out to x limited it is being sold out to x limited while doing the solution you have to ask yourself number one which division is being sold out division b to whom it is being sold out x limited to whom x limited is delivering the purchase consideration this should be your next question to yourself purchase consideration this time as it is given in the question x limited has decided to deliver it to the members deliver it to the members of the of the organization members means shareholders of shareholders of this particular entity that mean purchase consideration is being given to the members now you have to pay attention towards this particular fact whether it is written in the question whether it is written in the question that any share any member is having control over the new company this information is not given then you ask again yourself whether it is given in the question that none of the member is having more than 50 percent stakes in the new company this information is also not given and i told you that whenever purchasing company new company will give the consideration directly sorry consideration to the members three situations may unfold one after giving the purchase consideration one of the member is having 50 percent stakes in the new company then it will become a case of common control or none of the members is having more than 50 then it will become a case of india ascended in three or if the question remains silent then you presume it is a case of common control correct then you presume it as a case of common control because here the question is silent so we shall have to presume that it is a case of common control now if it is a case of con common control i told you a moment ago under the first step under the first step you will have to pa you have to prepare the uh, uh, what we call journal of demerged entity under part one even under part one one you will have to write journal of demerged entity that means journal of this organization Journal of Demerged Entity, DM Entity, Demerged Entity. Your first entry I told you with respect to transfer of assets and liability. Transfer of assets and liability. This will be your first entry. Transfer of assets and liability. Now you let me know what entry I am going to pass in this particular case. In this particular case, first of all, without an, without an iota of doubt, I am going to debit X limited. I am going to debit X limited because I have to receive some purchase consideration from the X limited. Next question is, how much amount you are supposed to receive from X limited? Because it is given in the question that X limited is delivering 2 lakh shares and of rupees 10 each at 15 per share. That means total issue rate is 25 so in order to determine the purchase consideration you will take into account the total issue rate so total purchase consideration will be considered as 50 lakh so i will debit x limited by 50 lakh because i have to receive 50 lakh from x limited now i am going to write here first of all all those liability which i have transferred now i am division b so one of my liability is this one correct so i am going to write here 600 so i will write here 600 then another liability is there also 800 i will write here just wait let me see actually whether i have framed the question correctly or not 850 200 or whatever it is anyway total is 1200 this total is coming to how much 1450 plus 200 1650 it's okay 
So, I will also write here current liability. I am division B. Current liability of division B is equal to 800. So, I will write here 800. All these items will be debited. Then, whatever assets are moving out, I am going to credit them. So, there are, as you must have noticed, two items of asset. One is pro property, plant and equipment and their written down value is 200. Then, there are current assets to the extent of 1000. Correct? Current asset is 1000, no? Right. 1000. Now, after having put this particular entry, now I will take the difference. As you can see, difference is appearing towards the credit side. I have already told you, if difference appears towards the credit side, in that case, no problem will arise. You simply write what we call capital reserve, 250. If that difference would have arisen towards the debit side, I would have had written here profit and loss account or general reserve. Correct? Because in the balance sheet, there is no capital reserve. Is it clear to you? So, this is the point you need to take care of. Now, next entry in the books of demersed entity will be with respect to receipt of consideration. Problem is that consideration is not received by us. Consideration has been received by members. Because consideration hasn't received by us, so it will be considered as a loss. So I will write here capital reserve. Just wait. First of all, I will credit the new company X Limited account. Because X Limited has discharged the cons consideration, that's a different matter. We haven't received the amount of consideration. Consideration has been received by members. So we didn't receive anything from what we call X Limited. Obviously, it is a loss. I told you a moment ago, because it is a loss and general principles of accounting states that if it is a capital loss, the first priority should be to debit it against capital nature profits. Because you are having a balance of capital reserve now, because in the first entry, a capital reserve has taken place, that means now you are having a balance in capital reserve. So this loss of 50 will be set off against this capital reserve. Are you getting my point or not? So that is why this is a loss actually and I am setting it off against the capital reserve. That is the point. If there would not have been any capital reserve, I would have put the loss to, uh, I would have debited what we call in that particular case profit or loss account or general reserve. After that, I am supposed to prepare the balance sheet. Correct? There are two steps in the books of, in the books of demersed entity, one journal entry and then I will also prepare the balance sheet. I told you preparation of balance sheet is very simple. Now, I will simply write non-current assets of A limited. Now, non-current assets of A limited is 50 because division B has been sold out. Similarly, I will simply write now current assets of division A that is equal to 400. So, total of the asset side will become uh, equal to 450. And then I will write as far as liability side is concerned, first of all, I will write here equity share capital. Now, equity share capital is actually 50 given of division A. Then other equity. See here. Here you have to exercise caution. Other equity of B limited is not taken over by C limited. Generally, the new entity will never ever take over your losses. Is it clear to you? So you have to be careful that this item hasn't been taken over. So that is the reason when I will write in the balance sheet, I will write other equity of A that is equal to 350. I will also write other equity of what we call Uh, other equity of division B, but division B is having a negative equity. So net balance in the outer column will be written as 150. Then non-current liability. Actually, division A is not having any non-current liability. And non-current liability of division B has been taken over. Similarly, I will write here current liability. Now current liability of only division A will come here. You have already seen how easy it is to prepare the balance sheet. So this is how you have to pass the entry you will have to do the accounting in the books of demersed entity. Correct? Demersed entity means the organization. After having gone through or after having done away this particular step, now under step number two,
अंडर स्टेप नंबर टू आई विल राइट बुक्स ऑफ न्यू कंपनी बुक्स ऑफ न्यू कंपनी बुक्स ऑफ न्यू कंपनी ना इन द बुक्स ऑफ न्यू कंपनी न्यू कंपनी इज नोन एज एक्वायर एंटिटी और परचेजिंग एंटिटी यू बेटर यूज द वर्ड परचेजिंग कंपनी बिकॉज हेयर आई टोल्ड यू इंडिया हंड्रेड एंड थ्री इज नॉट अप्लाइड बिकॉज इट इज अ केस ऑफ कॉमन कंट्रोल सो अंडर कॉमन कंट्रोल जनरली वी यूज द वर्ड परचेजिंग कंपनी ऑनली बट स्टिल आई एम यूजिंग द वर्ड एक्वायर कंपनी फॉर द सेक ऑफ अंडरस्टैंडिंग परचेजिंग कंपनी नाउ यू आर परस्यूव योर सेल्फ एज द परचेजिंग कंपनी your first entry will be for assets and liabilities which you have taken over so which assets you have taken over you simply record them you have taken over property plant and equipment of division b and you have taken them over at a book value of rupees 200 only the book values will find place similarly you have taken over the current asset at a valuation of 1000 carrying amount then i will write here two non current liability we have taken over non current liability 600 we have also taken over current liability to the extent of 800 to the extent of 800 then how much consideration i am supposed to pay here is the tricky point actually consideration is 2 lakh shares and the face value of the share into 10 is equal to 20 lakhs is equal to 20 lakhs and 2 lakh into 15 premium amount is almost equal to 30 lakhs premium amount is 30 lakh which figure should write in the books of acquirer or purchasing entity which figure i should write 50 lakh or 20 lakhs i should write 20 lakh only the face value correct but many a student here get confused sir it is given in the question 50 lakhs you are writing 20 lakhs actually as per the guideline of the appendix we have to write here only the nominal value but the fact is that even if i would have written here 50 lakh ultimately things would have been what we got similar i will prove it in a second just wait then <coughs> consideration amount is 20 lakh then i will take into account the balancing figure actually balancing figure is not appearing towards this side balancing figure is appearing towards debit side I told you in case of common control whether the balancing figure in the books of acquirer is towards the credit side or debit side we have to write capital reserve correct so i will be writing here capital reserve it's a negative balance no doubt about that i can write in bracket goodwill that's a different matter debit balance of capital reserve is nothing but goodwill now you try to understand suppose if i would have written here 50 lakh 20 plus 30 what would have happened ultimately there would not have been any difference why because here i would have written 50 then my loss would have gone up by 30 so ultimately things would have been similar so no problem whether we are writing here premium or not actually we are simply following the guidelines of the appendix correct so that is the point which you need to understand so in this particular case it is not going to have any effect because even though if you would have written here 50 lakh that mean your credit side would have been bigger by 30 so your loss would have also gone up by 30 now second entry for payment of consideration now i will make the payment for consideration my entry will be consideration account debit 20 lakhs and i will write here two share capital two share capital that is 20 lakhs is it clear to you now balance sheet on the asset side i will simply look into these two entries i have taken over property plant and equipment so i will simply write under non current asset property plant and equipment now property plant and equipment i have taken over at a carrying value of 200 current assets 1000 correct and then i have taken over liabilities so on the liability side i will write non current liability that is equal to 600 then i have taken over current liability to the tune of 800 and then here i have made a payment of 20 lakhs so i will write under share capital 20 lakhs under share capital i am going to write 20 lakhs is it clear to you 
could anyone among you tell me what else I need to write? Because as per these two entries, I have recorded property, plant and equipment. I have recorded current asset. I have recorded non-current liability, current liability. Consider consideration will get cancelled because once here it is credited, here debited. And I have written share capital. What else is remaining? This figure is still remaining. Capital reserve. It is having a debit balance. So I will write it under other equity. And I will write here capital reserve. And I will write it as a negative item, 220. Now, if you are going to tally, it will be equal to 1,200, 1,200. This is how you have to do the accounting. Is it clear to you? Now, if this particular question, if this particular question would have been, let us say, not of common control case, you would have done the accounting in the books of D merged entity as it is. Only thing is that here in the books of new company, you would have applied India 103. And as per India ended in three, we have to take here fair value, but actually fair values are not given. So I will take the same value. I will take the same value, same value, same value. But only difference is that here I would have written goodwill. And second, I would have written here 50 lakhs. Here I would have written 50 lakhs. Correct. Are you getting my point or not? Obviously, if I'm writing 50 lakhs over here, then my payment entry would have been consideration account debit 50 lakh to share capital 20 lakh to security premium account 30 lakhs. This difference would have taken place. Is it clear to you or not? Is it clear? Right, sir. So this, these are the topics which I just wanted to cover under India ascended in three. Remember one thing, I have left some question. I have marked it in the initial stages. Those questions which we have left or for that distance, those topics, those will be covered under amalgamation tomorrow. Tomorrow at 9 p.m. I have already also cautioned each and everyone. Henceforth, videos will be taken off immediately after the session. So okay then, that's all for the day. And with that, we come to the end of this particular chapter. Kindly let me know through your messages. Messages on YouTube comment boxes. On you. Last time, some messages were really very, very wonderful. And I will read those messages in the next session. And I'm over here. I'm thankful to you. But what your messages do, how it benefits you and us. Actually, it helps us a lot. It gives us zeal. It gives us vigor, it gives us energy, and importantly, it gives a message to the other student fraternity that simply don't waste your time, money. So better join these sessions and get what we call maximum mileage. So on such count, I take leave of you. Looking forward to hold you another meeting with you tomorrow at same time. Correct? With the chapter amalgamation. Notes of the amalgamation will be available on you on the channels at 7 p.m. So kindly download those notes at 7 p.m. I'm talking about not a.m. Is it clear to you? 7 p.m. You can download the notes. So and then I will meet you tomorrow. Is it clear? Okay, then five. Thank you. And thank you very much for your presence. And thank you for your precious time.